Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the December 16th, 2019 Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. All of you would please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, would you like to do the roll, please? Nicholas McGee. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. Robin Saunders. Here. Rick Duperry. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Rick Meinking. Here. All right, please let the record show that we are missing uh, Rachel this evening, so Rick Duperry will be a voting member. Uh, we have the minutes for the November 25th, 2019 meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to accept those minutes as written? Um, with just receiving them now, I, I prefer time to review them ahead of time. Yeah, I'm were, just receiving them now. They were emailed out earlier. Got it. I'll abstain. Thanks. So moved. I got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Make sure that three with an attention. First item on tonight's agenda <clears throat> is 90A Payne Road LLC requests a site inventory and analysis review as part of a planned development project for 289 Payne Road Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4A. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this first project is located in the Highest Parkway Zoning District uh, along Payne Road across from Gin Road. Uh, the applicant was before the board a few meetings ago uh, presenting the sketch plan. So it's a sort of a two-part review process, but first, it's site inventory and analysis um, as part of the plan de development review. So the site inventory and analysis is intended to provide the applicant, the board, and staff with a better understanding of the overall site and opportunities constraints that the natural and built environment create for the development. The review tonight does not re result in a formal approval. Uh, the board should be sure to determine if the information provides a clear understanding of the site and identifies opportunities and constraints that will guide the utilization of the site. Uh, staff was generally comfortable with the submission, um, but did note that the site inventory plan uh, did not include a vegetative cover conditions, um, but the applicant did provide this information within their narrative. Uh, so the board should provide direction if you are comfortable with the info provided. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, Mr. Frank, would you like to introduce the uh, project? And Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with uh, Sebago Technics in South Portland. Uh, and I think uh, Jamel hit it right on it perfectly. Uh, we were actually in front of the board with a sketch plan, as you may recall, in early November. Um, uh, the project site's a little over six and a half acres. It's right across from Ginn Road, uh, just under six and a half acres, excuse me, right across from Ginn Road on, uh, on Payne Road, uh, right next to the abutting the site now, which is uh, previously approved for the, for the Acura dealership. Um, again, out of the six plus acres, about half of it is wetlands. Uh, which certainly we see as the main constraint to development. Uh, as you may recall, as part of the sketch plan, pretty much we've held all the proposed development on the uplands. Uh, they're identified as Elmwood soils, so the soils are good. Uh, we do have availability of all utilities, so in fact it will be in the municipal sewer and water. Um, uh, looking at Jamel's comments, from a stormwater standpoint, uh, we were proposing uh, actual gravel wetlands to treat the runoff associated with this development, which from my standpoint is probably the most robust uh, treatment uh, uh, proposed um, and from a tree standpoint he's absolutely right we did not go out and locate every tree 24 inches in diameter um, what we are pretty much saying is pretty much the limits of the grading I think you can pretty much see is you know the existing vegetation will be, be removed and we'll have a re landscaping plan within those areas and obviously outside of the grading area which is certainly all of the wetlands itself will remain undisturbed uh, so if there are trees in there, those will certainly all be retained uh, in their natural state. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, again, I think from our standpoint, we really see wetlands as the main uh, uh, hindrance, if you will, to development of this site. Uh, and from a development standpoint, our whole point is basically to, to stay out of the wetlands altogether. Uh, and with that, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here from the public that would like to speak on this, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. I'm just going to open this one up generally to the board if there was any um, general questions about the site inventory and analysis phase of this. We do have the uh, 
more planning related questions coming up on the next item of the agenda. So, <coughs> Robin? Yeah, I'm just, <clears throat> can you help me um, identify where the wetlands are? Yes, I'm sorry. Good, it is on. Uh, the wetland line is basically right along here. Okay. okay. Is that the same line you use for the watershed boundary? Uh, yes, it is. I have a couple of young gentlemen that have been assisting me on this. Okay. Uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, usually a watershed boundary, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, consists of a high point and everything that runs to it. So help me understand why it's... I think from this standpoint, they were just looking at the impact. Obviously, we're not proposing any development associated with here. So okay. I don't think we really worry too much about the pre and post at this particular point. We're just looking at the watershed associated with the development area. So actually, we get a higher pre and post differential associated with that. So okay, so the, so the wetland is outside the watershed boundary. Is that Correct. what you're saying? Uh, okay. The, from our standpoint, from just in terms of looking at okay. the pre and post, we just looked at it as the developed site. Okay, and so you're asserting that 100% of the wetlands will be left in, intact? Yes, on our current design as it is stands right now, okay. we will not be impacting wetlands at all. And in the staff notes, you'll see that um, you're proposing to develop in a um, in the Willowdale Brook watershed. So the staff and correct me if I'm wrong, I think I'm looking at the right one. It's been a long week and it's only Monday. <laughs> That's why I so um, understand. Um, it says that staff encourages the applicant to design the project to help prevent additional impacts within the watershed. So at this point, do you feel like you have anything to offer that or should we check in with you on the master planning? Well, and I'd be happy to have additional conversation regarding that, but again, I think you know, number one, remember, as part of the sketch, we actually discussed about uh, uh, this additional parking, mm -hmm. which I know it's not real clear here, but the intent is basically we'll gravel leave, but then loan and seed over it, so we, you know, the parking, if we need it, we could be easily adjustable, but uh, to maintain as much green space as we can, again, with the access, uh, but again, actually proposing uh, mm -hmm. uh, gravel wetlands in association with the runoff, the treatment of the runoff, and again, at least from my standpoint anyway, I think those are more, uh, from a treatment perspective, I think those are the okay. most robust. Are, are you considering this uh, curb and gutter? Or will it be sort of graded to run off, Sean? The majority of it will be curbed just because, again, obviously it's a, it's a relatively urban site in terms of the parking associated with it, so it will be curbed in catch basins and, yes, via storm drains to the, um, okay. to the, to the ground. And you're planning to update the vegetative cover? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Any other general questions on the site inventory now analysis part of this? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to... Uh, and go ahead and make the assumption that the report is comfortable with this this portion of the plan. We'll move on to the second portion of the plan, which is 90A Payne Road LLC request a master plan review as part of a plan development project for 289 Payne Road Assessors Map R52, Lot 4A. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So getting into more detailed review, still pretty high level, uh, but the applicant's proposing a 13,000 square foot uh, building that will consist of up to six storefronts. As a general reminder, the master plan is intended to generally lay out how the plan development will be developed, including the proposed use of various parts of the site, the primary road and pedestrian network, overall pro approach to stormwater management, proposed development areas, and any open space and buffer areas that will apply in the development. Uh, so the board should only approve the master plan if it finds it complies with the zoning standards and is consistent with the site inventory and analysis and reflects a reasonable utilization of the site, uh, given both the built and environmental conditions. So as a reminder, uh, during the sketch plan review, the board did express um, that you were comfortable with the proposed parking layout um, between the road and the building, uh, so long as a robust landscaping program provides adequate screening. Um, staff did know that there appears to be an opportunity for a pedestrian or just a gathering area uh, for employees and patrons along the southerly property line. And finally, as previously noted during sketch plan, the town's public safety departments have continued to express concerns about the proposed driveway location, uh, given the lane configurations and speed along this portion of Payne Road. So staff has recommended that the specific driveway location uh, be determined uh, during the formal site plan review with the board when the formal traffic study that's required will be provided for your review. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jamel. 
Mr. Frank, you're up again. Yes, I'm still on. I'm actually going to come over to the plant. I just can't see myself too well over there. Um, again, I think from the site plan standpoint, it's pretty much the same, pretty close to what we were proposing in terms of the sketch plan associated with this. Um, again, the back parking, as we discussed, uh, and as we discussed with the board, will actually be well seated in association with that. Uh, we are proposing just over 13,000 square feet of retail. Uh, we've been discussing with the board the double wall parking, certainly with the robust landscaping, as Janelle mentioned, along the front, uh, retain uh, buffers, uh, all of this far around as we possibly can, and obviously where we cannot uh, put in some additional landscaping associated with that and retain uh, all of the wetlands, as we discussed earlier. Um, in their existing natural states. Uh, just looking at the staff comments, uh, uh, certainly in terms of the conceptual site plan, uh, we agree with all of that. Um, the fire department, there actually is a hydrant that's uh, right at the entrance, uh, the, the site entrance associated with this. So we think from that standpoint, we're in real good shape. We will have a sprinkled building. Uh, we did do the auto turn uh, for the 40 foot ladder truck and we can get it all around the site within the areas. Um, we will certainly to show all of the buffer requirements in association with the neighborhood mitigation plan. Uh, again, we did discuss the stormwater management in terms of the gravel wetlands we were talking about, um, and certainly uh, uh, we have actually applied as well to the uh, to the DEP in association with the stormwater permit associated with that. Uh, the wetlands had originally been done in 2012. We did update that wetlands this year. Um, so actually Gary Fullerton did go out um, and certainly if you're looking for a report, we'll certainly have him prepare something associated with that. Um, uh, in terms of the development and design standards, uh, again, obviously we just understand that we have to meet uh, the zoning requirements and the, uh, the site plan review requirements for the town associated with the, uh, the town's design standards. I think as we looked at the sketch plan in terms of the buildings and the site design, I thought we, uh, we were uh, in pretty good shape in association with that, again, at least at the sketch plan uh, presentation standpoint. Uh, the dumpsters certainly will be enclosed. Uh, I did discuss the auto turn and certainly we will uh, coordinate with the Scarborough Sanitary District. Again, just for a, a, a quick analysis, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, there are obviously all utilities uh, within Payne Road that will be extended to the site, uh, including natural gas. Uh, we are still proposing uh, the driveway right across from Ginn Road. There is a left turn lane going into Ginn Road at that location. Our anticipation is that we're going to have a left turn lane as well, although that's some additional work within Payne Road to just restripe into that area, uh, a left turn uh, coming into our driveway as well. Um, and we do think that that's going to make the most appropriate spot, if you will, for those conflicting traffic movement turns is right there at that intersection. Um, we do appreciate uh, uh, the town planner and what he was saying in terms of uh, we're performing and we'll wrap up ready, relatively quickly here a full traffic analysis associated with that. We certainly understand there's a peer review process that the town has and with that as well. And certainly if, if there's a consensus that, you know, the driveway has to be relocated, we'll certainly look at that. But again, right now, our first thought is that uh, based upon uh, the competing interests that are going on at that particular area, that that's the correct location. Obviously, there's a signalized intersection uh, right there at Hagus. Um, so we think from a, a, a speed standpoint, I guess I was a little surprised to hear speed being a main concern at that particular point. Uh, because again, just the fact that there is that signal right in through there. But again, certainly we will coordinate that through the town's review process. And obviously if we have to look at something different with that drive, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I conclude my little presentation. Again, be happy to answer any questions the board has. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> we have an opportunity for public comment on this item as well. If there's anyone here that wants to speak, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comments. Um, I'm just going to open this one up as well to the board in general. If anyone wants to take a, a poke at it. Jen? I have a question about parking spaces. Um, so your the parking summary that you provided on sheet one identifies um, 54 parking spaces required and 65 parking spaces provided. You're also showing um, 12 spaces sort of reserved. And those will be long been seated and we should make that much more clear. Again, our intention was we're going to be out here grading this parking lot anyway, that we would grade that area and actually get the gravel down there. But the intent is something that we'll have long seat over that, so we'll be vegetated uh, at so least as part of this, and that will vegetate the access drive. Again, this is just a maintenance access drive coming down. Sure. 
Um, I wasn't clear about whether or not those future spaces were included in, it looks like they're in addition to. The 60 some odd spaces, yes. Remember yeah. when we were here for sketch, I think we were actually, that those 12 were actually included working in that. Out, so, working that out, okay. And I think that was the discussion we had with the board, that we could at least, you know, uh, get those down a little bit, try to minimize that impervious area a little bit more. Than we do. Okay. I just, the math wasn't jumping out right. at me. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll make sure that man is clear on the, on the next submission. Thank you. Anyone else on the board have a question? Go ahead, Rick. Uh, yeah, I just have a couple. So just looking at your, and I know this is just an overview, but you're um, looking at your site plan and where your transformer is and where your snow storage is. So, you know, I'd just be very aware of that you need to maintain clearance around that transformer. I appreciate that, yes. And again, obviously we're trying to identify some areas for, right. for right. snow, and, and I mean, again, it's, it's always that balance and that landscaping, you know what I mean, is one, and obviously we don't want to be pushing all the snow in the landscaping, obviously we can't be pushing a bunch of snow in the wetlands, we can't push them into the stormwater thing, so it's just really trying to identify areas that we can actually push right. the snow into. So. so don't push your snow into the transformer. No. <laughs> make me really mad. Um, and then, I know, do you have, uh, coming back out on the pain road, do you have a left-hand turn? I mean, is that three lanes coming out on the pain road, or is it just... For our driveway? We're yeah. just showing two lanes at this point, one in and one out. Uh, that may be something we'll want to take a look at in terms of, based upon what the analysis comes up with at this intersection, do we need to have a third lane, wow. have a designated left turn? My anticipation is, again, just from the initial numbers we're coming, that we're probably looking, like I say, right now there's a left turn going into Ginn Road, and our anticipation is maybe looking at a left turn coming into our driveway as well. I was thinking, and I appreciate that, that makes sense. I was thinking more when you're, when you're exiting, so that I'm not so much concerned about the end as I am, is you've got six storefronts and potentially busy stores, right? So if you've got someone trying to make a left turn, you've got 10 people trying to make a right turn, you know, potentially you're going to back up into that parking lot when you don't need to. So if you had a right hand, if you could make that three lanes, I know we're always concerned about impervious surface and stuff, but I really think it makes sense to have a right-hand lane out with that much, with that volume. Oh, that's a good point. Also, I'm going to look at that. Okay. And then Rick, Rick's sitting down there. But, um, we're going to want you to dim your lights. You know that, right? Yes. Okay. That's I, will all. Get a, I will get a photo of so. Robin. Um, can you talk to me about the setback from the wetland and um, if it's normal for the gravel wetland to be within the 25-foot setback from that? We tried to maintain a 25-foot setback. 25, as you know, it's not jurisdictional. You know, it's adjacency is not jurisdictional. So, uh, but a, a, a wetland, the good side of the wetland, from my standpoint, again, gravel wetlands, I think it's because it's always got water and it's always got vegetation growing. Uh, we get good treatment associated with it. The downside of it is, you know, the outfall from it is winds up being pretty close to what we need to get to. So I, I do want to get close to the wetland, um, but again, the impact, my anticipate, our, our proposal that we don't have any impact on the wetland itself, and that the only impact on the 25 foot setback, hopefully, I think I do have a little right here at this driveway as well, is, uh, you know, is with the gravel wetland. Okay. Again, just working with DEP, I did tell them that you know, we would do our best to maintain a 25 foot setback. They are asking for that, uh, but it is, like I said, it's not a specific requirement associated with is, it. Is this going to go through, get a Chapter 500 permit, or yes, is this it site is. law? Okay. Yes. All right, so you'll go through DEP and yes, include we are. Angela. Yes, submitted for that. And include the town engineer in those uh, I meetings? I believe we made a copy. I, I don't know if she, I, she did not come to the, uh, the uh, pre application. Pre application? Was she whatever, invited? Whatever. As long as she was invited. Yeah, I think we made her okay. aware. I know. Okay. I know she's running around. Yeah, lot, absolutely. So. <clears throat> um, the fifteen, the 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 buffer, I guess. Um, our buffer standards do ask that all sides be maintained in its natural state to provide a visual screen, and then also can be augmented with landscaping, meaning you know trees, shrubs, and a berm if you need to. So what's what's your plan with the uh, the buffer area? This area, I think that, again. If, if you've been out there, there's not an awful lot right now between the road and where mm -hmm. So our anticipation is we're going to have a small berm here and, and planted quite heavily. Uh, we maintain what we can along this property line. That's the Acura. That's down and through there. But obviously uh, our anticipation will be augmenting that down and through here as well. 
we see the whole thing, the point is along the wetland itself is pretty much just retaining wood line uh, as far as we can down in through there. It's only along the back. Uh, but obviously, when we're getting too close to the property line down through here, our anticipation is just, you know, basically re landscaping. Have you done any test pits to find out how close to groundwater table you are? I think we have. Or is it right at the surface? And unfortunately, that's part when we did the initial submission, we, we had. Um, and I think what we're basically finding out is, you know, the elevation of the wetland is pretty much the elevation of the groundwater. And just understand too that being abutting to the Acura dealership, they are, <clears throat> they are miti they're, I shouldn't say mitigating. They are impacting a significant amount of wetlands there, which could cause the groundwater table to change substantially as well. So, please keep that in mind, uh, it, including when you go to talk to DEP about a gravel wetland, because you know, as our statics teacher always said, you can't push on a rope, Sean. You can't make <laughs> yes, it infiltrate. Your if statics the, teacher told you that too. Right. Yes. Okay. If the groundwater <laughs> table wants to rise, it's going to rise, and the gravel wetland may not work kind of thing. So you're going to have some challenging elevations there. Um, but again, um, I know that we'll dig into that during the sub, you know, during uh, future discussions. Um, I think one of the other, I guess I, I will take you up on the conversation then that staff would like us to have regarding the pedestrian gathering space and whether or not uh, amenities will pro be provided. You know, my thought is a lawn and maybe a couple of picnic tables. I don't know, you know, what else we may be talking. I don't know how used they would be, to be perfectly honest with you. But again, I'll certainly, my client is here. Uh, unfortunately, you got here just a little late, late but I, we've not had a chance to have this specific conversation. Uh, but certainly we will. Um, I don't know if you folks are looking for anything more robust than that. I think from our standpoint, we're seeing this more as a destination. I mean, if for anything, it'd probably be more for the employees rather than people coming to visit. I certainly don't see people coming to whatever it might be a retail or the dentist or something, an eye, an eye doctor, uh, and wanting to go hang around out back. I mean, certainly I would see it more for, you know, people that would work there, to be honest with you. Um, so, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, some picnic table, it'll certainly be a lawn area down along that access, going to the, 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 the gravel access, going back towards the gravel wetlands. So, uh, um, you know, we could certainly look at put some lawn area down there with some uh, picnic tables or something along those lines. At least that's what I was kind of thinking, Robin, but I'm certainly wide open to conversation with that. <clears throat> Does anyone have any comments on that or I guess? For, for what it's worth, um, just given this, the type of development this is, I would, I would assume too, it would be more of a employee use okay. um, gathering space. I'm not knowing exactly what type of clientele you'll have or businesses that will be located there, but um, very little for walking paths, and quite frankly, this is also cutting the Downs property, which would have more extensive walking paths and maybe gathering spaces than this exact location. Um, those are my two cents. Anyone else wants to weigh in? Roger? Um, when you were here last, um, you were talking about the larger portion being a restaurant. Is, is that still in the plans? No, okay. No, there's no longer part, and, and I think we actually have. Remember when the first sketch we were kind of looking at, it was, I, I think I had arrows on the driveways, I recall, and some other things that we kind of t discussed at that point, uh, because we were looking at a restaurant, but no, the restaurant actually, it's, it's, it's pretty much going to be reta retail professional you know, services. Okay, the, the reason I brought it up, I wanted to bring it up again, because when I'm looking at that, I'm thinking of, in, with your parking, parking situation, I'm reminded of the Starbucks and the, uh, the, bank, uh, the Benefit Savings Bank on, on Route 1, and how there's an overflow of people going to Starbucks, and they they actually end up parking at the bank. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and I would I would think that would happen if you had a restaurant there, possibly that would intrude on your other tenants, you know, parking. But that's moved at this point. It is moved at this point. And uh, uh, again, obviously, from the parking standpoint, well, the reason we actually have that drive going around is because just because we hate dead end parking. What I really hate with somebody, especially when you only have the one drive, is someone comes in, they take a left in the parking lot, and there's no empty parking spots. And they basically have to try to back out of that parking spot, so, or that whole parking aisle. So that's why it's, you know, we, we'd like to maintain that, that access around the building so that, you know, not just for fire, but certainly for, uh, for people to be able to get around the site as well. Sure. And the only other um, question I was going to bring up was the access to the site, but I guess you're going to deal with that. And again, if it makes more, I mean, I still, I, my belief, and I, I bounce this off of my traffic guys quite a bit, is, you know, they still think that where we're showing it is the right spot. And again, especially in the fact that our anticipation is we're going to have a left turn lane coming in, or at least a striped left turn lane coming into our site as well. And that really makes them think that that makes it the appropriate spot. But 
again, certainly, you know, we're wide open to conversations, and, uh, you know, I, again, I know you have a peer review traffic engineer, and certainly, uh, uh, certainly understand public safety, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly we'll work with, with the yeah, team. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if the peer reviewer comes up with the same idea that Rick had about a right turn lane right out. You know? so, that's all I have. Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> Anyone else? Um, just one other quick question. Any thought given to discussions with the neighboring property about um, shared access between the two sites? Well, yes, we did <laughs> at one point. Um, and uh, you can see what we're still showing at this point in time. Um, again, that's <laughs> not to say that's a dead issue, but uh, it's, it takes, takes it, especially where their driveway was coming out onto Payne Road, we thought that that may make more sense. Um, but uh, again, you can see, uh, you know, where we are, where we are, because, uh, uh, yeah, we have our driveway. Understood. Were they not interested or you're not interested? That's, that's interesting because they, they only have a right, oops, they only have a right out. Right That's correct, yeah. because the island's there. The island yeah. is the, 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 there's a median island in the middle of a pain road that yeah. presents them from going left out of that driveway. So that's why we actually thought it would be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's all right. Rick? By the plans, it looks like you may, but you said you were gonna do a photometric plan for yes, this. Yes, we certainly will get a photometric like for you. you. And your it, parking lot lights are enough not that I want to increase load, but I don't think you've got the coverage where your lights are on the plan here. I appreciate that. And again, I would, I, I think it's probably more, take it from like Sean yeah. probably, where we're talking building mounted and a few uh, light poles, uh, but certainly we will get, uh, we'll get some input on that. Also, maybe throw in a couple of charging stations there. You might have some eye doctor that might drive an EV or something like that, that maybe we can, or at least have conduit in there in the ground. So you keep working on me, and one of these days it'll actually be on the site plan without you having to ask for it. <laughs> Someday it'll be in an oral mix, so we won't have to ask for it. That's all I got. Thank you, Rick. Any other? It looks like you've satisfied most of it. I'm going to go ahead and just, um, for, my, for what it's worth, my two cents, and I know we need that traffic moving permit study done, but I suspect that uh, either a, a third lane there to help move some traffic out of that site is worth is a worthwhile effort. That's a good, um, that was that, a good point. That's going to be an incredibly busy road. Uh, it's going to continue to be developed all along there. Uh, and the traffic count's probably coming out of the downs once that's fully uh, developed. You're going to see a lot more traffic moving past this property, um, which is, is really going to create um, a hard time for anyone visiting your development to make that left turn if possible. So just food for thought. Uh, I know you're going to do some more homework. So at this point, um, <clears throat> We do have a uh, motion. I move to approve the conceptual master plan titled Payne Road Crossing proposed by 90A Payne Road LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics did 11-18-19 with the following findings. Findings. The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the conceptual master plan is consistent with the site inventory and analysis and reflects a reasonable utilization of the site given both environmental and built environment considerations. The conceptual master plan is also consistent with the space and bulk standards, the development standards, and other requirements for plan developments in the Hygus Parkway zoning district. During the site plan review, the final location for the utilities, driveway, location, and parking will be determined. The site plan submission shall address the remaining staff review comments in the memo dated 12 16 19. That is the motion. Second. And a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing so none, all in favor. That's unanimous. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate your Good time. Luck. Next item on tonight's agenda is Ann Child Enterprises LLC requests a site plan review for 79 County Road Assessors Map R15, Lot 78. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project's located in the TVC2 zoning district at the corner of County Road and Saco Street. If you may recall, the applicant was last before you all in May uh, when they were granted master plan approval. So the applicant's proposing a thousand square foot uh, coffee shop with drive-through lanes, parking, and landscaping provisions. 
Uh, staff has noted that the project will result in a significant amount of vehicle trips being added to a very busy corridor uh, here in town. The town's traffic consultant has noted that the dedicated left turn lane along Sockle Street uh, will be required. The applicant will need to coordinate with town staff on the design and construction of this and the associated sidewalk um, that is planned along the western side of Saco Street. The project will also require a traffic movement permit uh, with the main D DOT, uh, so the applicant should provide the board with a, an update, update on this permitting process. The project is subject to the town's commercial design standards as well. Uh, staff has pointed out uh, several standards that apply to the proposal, including the corner building and facade treatment standards. Additionally, the design <laughs> standards allow for the board to request renderings of this project to illustrate how it will look for, when viewed from the public ways. This will also allow for the board to review the required buffering along County Road and Saco Street. The approved master plan included a sidewalk connection uh, to a future pedestrian signal and crosswalk at the intersection and staff was unable to find that on the site plans and has recommended that future submissions include this element. Uh, the applicant is proposing to provide five parking spaces instead of the required ten. Uh, the zoning standards do allow for the board to reduce the requirements for parking uh, where it is determined that a project can be occupied with less spaces than is required. So the board will need to determine if the use can be carried on with the five spaces as proposed. And finally, a full stormwater review uh, was not completed by staff or the town's peer reviewers uh, based on some uh, missing information in the submission. So this information will need to be provided uh, with future submissions. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. The applicant would like to approach the podium. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, before we start, I'm a director butter and Rick's here tonight, so I'm just gonna recuse myself and let him Sounds in. Sounds good. I have no, oh, I have no issues with this project, <laughs> so I just thought I'd throw that up. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so just let the record show for this item, Rick Mine King will be replacing <laughs> Rick DuPerry. Thank you. And go ahead. Good evening. Uh, Sean Thies of CES Engineers representing the applicant tonight. Um, as Jamel had uh, explained and similar to the uh, concept plan that uh, we presented to you back in May with the master plan it's a uh, thousand square foot drive-through coffee shop uh, access off of Saco Street um, the plan I believe as presented is um, um, pretty much the same as uh, what was presented back in May as far as the layout of the site and uh, the main main details of the site um, we are proposing as uh, Jamel noted five uh, parking spaces uh, right now, but we have also shown an area for five uh, future spaces uh, just to the north of where we're showing the five proposed. If the board um, decides that uh, that the five proposed are not sufficient, there is room to construct additional spaces on the site. Um, the facility is um, served with a, a proposed on-site well and an on-site uh, septic system. We are proposing pervious pavement for the whole development to address uh, stormwater concerns. It's very sandy soil on this site, um, so we're expecting the, all the uh, water to infiltrate into the ground, which I believe that was, uh, Jamel noted, some lacking stormwater information. I, I believe it was in relation to uh, infiltration rates of the on-site soils in that area. Um, in regards to the uh, sidewalk, connection to the corner um, we had included that in the master plan um, at the time it was my understanding that that was sort of a master plan that sidewalk to be constructed when and if um, the town decides to do improvements on that intersection and construct uh, sidewalks in the area um, so that's why we didn't show it on the on the site plan as it is now because um, we're not aware of any uh, plans for those sidewalks to be constructed at this time, but if those are are being planned and it sounds like there's some other uh, Sidewalks planned on the opposite side of Saco Street, but we haven't seen any of those uh, plans for whatever stage they are at for the town, but um, I think that's sort of the general uh, Overview of the site and then I I do have some I guess questions on some of the review comments that we had from staff that I'd like to, to go through at some point. 
So I think <clears throat> as far as the uh, main elements staff has uh, brought up, is there any confusion on any of the main elements? Uh, should be the first kind of heftier set of the main elements. So <clears throat> the I get the, the first one is um, uh, renderings and the requirement of renderings. And we provided our landscape plan and we provided um, building elevations, which are um, going to be revised, I know, to meet. I mean, we had provided those before and we never really received any comments, but um, similar to the other uh, Aroma Joe's project, um, apparently those need to be revised to reflect a 20 foot tall building, um, which is different than what we had previously submitted. But um, um, but I think the question is, um, is the board going to require uh, some sort of a 3D rendering to, uh, to reflect the, the building and the landscape plan? Okay. We're going to take note of these as you go through them and okay. we'll, we'll respond. Um, uh, the second comment that I had under that section or question, uh, well, again, was just in relation to um, the building plans. Um, uh, we're working on revised plans, which I think will be will be similar to the other the other project, which we'll discuss later. Um, these these buildings are the same model store, so they're uh, the, the idea is the the building plans will be the same for for both sites. Hi, I'm Tanya Chinkat. I am the landowner. Hello, neighbor. Um, so this is my third, if not fourth, time. So is the 20-foot or two-story requirement something that's happened since May? Because I appeared before you th for three, this is my third, at least my third meeting, and nothing has ever previously been mentioned. My pre previous submissions have all been approved, and now at this stage of the game, I'm being told that I need to go back and I need to revise my building um, to be 20 feet or two stories. If I, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but the phasing that you've gone through through this process, so you do the first site inventory analysis, so basically you're finally at a stage where we get to see what your building elevations and um, some of those dimensions look like, where maybe previously those weren't part of the packages. You guys have seen renderings before. You've all, there were photos that we've provided before. I'll, I'll also add that the site plan review is really when the board gets into the details of every part of the ordinance, um, whereas master plan is sort of the overall look look of the site. Um, so you'll, there's a lot more detail, detailed comments that are provided within site plan compared to master plan. So that's why this came from where it did. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's a multi-step process that we go through here. And just so you know, um, you know, this is what the zoning requirement states it needs to be. Um, doesn't mean that this board has not or will not um, deviate under certain circumstances, but I think the idea is that we need to see it, um, sure. which is also kind of goes hand in hand with like a three. I mean, and and we're talking, it's, it's sure. a matter of two feet here. Obviously, it just costs me more money. <laughs> Every change you make, single mom here, so trying to keep my costs as low as possible. I'm sure you can all appreciate that. Um, but we also are trying to keep with the aesthetic of the brand. So all of these buildings are trying to, we're trying to maintain the same, I'm not, it's, it's not as if somebody going down the street's not going to recognize it because my building's two feet taller than the other Aroma Joe's, but there, you know, there is a, a bit brand aesthetic that we're trying to maintain as well. Sure. We can, uh, just so you know, we, we can appreciate that. And as a board, we would, um, we would visually view what you have and see if there's deviations that we feel are appropriate. Great. So. Um, the parking space uh, width, we'll adjust that, um, and we'll provide the additional soils information for stormwater. Um, the remaining elements, um, there was a question about aquifer protection overlay district. Um, applicants shall provide justification that these standards are being met with future submissions. I'm not exactly sure. Um, what we're looking for there, our septic system is less than uh, 2,000 gallons per day, so we're not required to do a nitrate analysis. And I believe the Woodard and Curran uh, staff, or Woodard and Curran peer review has indicated that um, we meet the Chapter 500 standards. So I'm not sure if there's additional 
uh, justification to that needs to be submitted to show that we're meeting the aquifer overlay. Uh, for site access, there's a comment about the driveway, existing driveway to the Ralph Tem homestead. Um, the current plan, um, I guess, doesn't it doesn't indicate that we're using the building for anything. It also doesn't indicate that it's being torn down. And the comment about removing the driveway, I'm just wondering, I mean, there's, that could have potential impacts. Um, I'm not aware of anything that says that they can't continue to use that building. And if we discontinue that driveway, there's no access to it from the current site. So we'd like some direction or input on that. Uh, there was a question about aisle width, I believe, uh, behind the parking spaces. Um, the aisle width is currently 15 feet and the ordinance calls for 13. I'm not sure where the, the measurement may have been taken from the contour line rather than the back of the parking spaces where that was uh, questioned what the width was. In the pedestrian ways, I've addressed the, the sidewalk. Um, Staff recommended a raised crosswalk across the aisle as um, to potentially as a traffic calming measure. Um, I guess I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that we would need a traffic calming measure in this instance for a um, traffic should be going fairly slow. They're approaching a drive through window. So I don't envision that as a lot of through traffic where you would need to be too worried about slowing them down. So. Uh, my thought is just a, a painted crosswalk should be sufficient in that area. And then um, the item right below that, it mentions uh, coordinating uh, with the town on the construction of the sidewalk on the opposite side of Saco Street. I'm not exactly sure what, what coordinate with the town means at that point because I know that there is uh, it was a comment that came up on the other other one about providing funds this doesn't say provide funds to help construct that sidewalk it just says coordinate so I'm not like some direction as to what is intended there as part of the um, requirement for the left turn lane if the town is planning to put a sidewalk on the uh, westerly side of Saco Street and there's a requirement to extend a left turn lane up Saco Street I'm a little concerned with the width of the right of way to be able to fit uh, both of those elements into the plan. Um, it seems like there's more room on the east side, unfortunately, for a, for a sidewalk, but that I don't think meets uh, the intent of what the town's trying to accomplish to get pedestrians on the west side of Saco Street. So that means there'd need to be a crossing somewhere else, but I think we'd have to see what the uh, what the town's plans are for all the improvements in that area to to be able to I guess coordinate our plans with that and my only my last comment or question is regarding uh, the landscape and buffering it talks about um, there's a comment about the buffering on the northerly property line so our our landscape plan calls out for plantings um, on the plan that's on the screen right now, sort of just to the north of the snow storage area. We had called out some plantings there to be, uh, I think there was like four plantings with a note to be at exact locations to be coordinated. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what this is reference, referencing. The master plan we had shown, we had also called for buffering to the property line that's further to the north. Um, but I would think that that would be more related to the other master plan development with additional buildings um, that could potentially be built in the future. If those were to be built, then we'd want some screening up in that area from those buildings, but um, I'm not sure that it's, it's necessary for, for what we're proposing at this stage. So I just, some clarification on what the northerly property line is. So. I think that's it. <clears throat> that's it. Thank you. 
Uh, there is an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that wants to speak, please approach the podium, state your name. Hi there. Um, my name is Kathleen Vance, and we are um, the abutting property owners, I believe, on the northern side. And sorry, we're coming into this late in the game. Um, haven't really had a chance to talk to the um, talk to anyone about this yet. Um, um, my father died, um, so we're kind of just getting our feet wet as to th this. This was his realm um, for dealing with with things, but we own. Um, um, all the way from, from 31 Saco Street, we own down to 45 Saco Street, and then we own um, several up already approved house lots on Vance Street, which is right there, and then uh, 10 acres um, down at the end of Vance Street. So we own a significant amount of land in that area. And I guess my concerns are, as we all know, um, I mean, as I know, once this property became available, I knew it was going to be developed by someone. Um, probably too late in the game to, to express my concern that I think an Aroma Joe's is a pretty high traffic business to put into a location that is already very congested with traffic at, at certain times of the day, both on Saco Street and the county road. Um, and now to see that they're they've gotten creative with their their entrance and their exit um, I, I can see they're trying to avoid um, any entrance or exit on County Road but they're putting it all onto Saco Street and the only thing that stands between their driveway and mine is uh, the Griffin um, plot of land which I assume at some point in time they'll probably acquire her her parcel of land so then I will be the direct a budding property owner. Um, uh, I'm just not, uh, traffic already backs up from County Road onto Saco Street down past Vance Street at certain times um, when I'm out there and, and I'm certainly so glad that I'm not trying to take a left-hand turn out of Vance Street and I'm, I'm taking a right-hand turn and heading back towards Westbrook. Um, so again, I have concerns about that. I have concerns about if we're now taking and paving all of this and um, the water runoff, how is that going to affect our land? Are we going to now be faced with um, um, water backing up onto the property line? I don't know where the wetlands are or what, you know, what exactly here um, is going to be paved and what's not going to be paved, but that's a concern. I don't want to end up with land that is wet right along the border. Um, these are parcels of one acre lots that have already been approved several years ago um, to build on just because we haven't elected to build on it doesn't mean we won't be building houses on them someday and I don't want to be dealing with a water issue um, at that time. I'm concerned about where they're going to pile, pile, pile their snow piles and when it melts uh, where that water is going to run and again is that going to flood us out um, I'm concerned about um, what I'm hearing tonight about um, a left-hand turn lane into their driveway. Um, as we all know, there, there is two lanes as, uh, on Salco Street as you approach County Road um, so that you can turn on County Road without impeding the traffic that wants to go straight um, or make a right-hand turn. But now to bring that turn lane all the way back to where their driveway is, you will be right in front of my house at 3133. Um, and I just, that's a residential neighborhood. Um, and I just, so that concerns me. I'm, I'm concerned about, about uh, headlights um, shining onto our properties out there as the cars pull into the driveway and as they swing around to come back out, their headlights are gonna be broadcast on all of our land down there on Vance Street and, and um, whatnot, so I'd, I'd definitely ask there be some buffers against headlights. Um, it's a pretty dark area out there, if any of you have ridden by there at nighttime, so I don't know what their hours are going to be for hours of operation. I know all of my tenants go to bed at 9 o'clock at night, um, so <laughs> um, again, these are just some of my initial concerns. I'm sorry I'm coming into the, it's so late in the game, and I'm sure I'll have a lot more. Um, 
but thank you for listening. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this topic? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comments. Um, Robin, do you like kicking this one off? Sure. Um, so I just sort of, my first question is for you, Jamel. Um, I just ask Rick, is this the place where someone was proposing uh, a child care center? Correct. Yep. And that person came in front of the board three or four times and then ended up abandoning Correct. that ish here because there were, there's aquifer overlay, aquifer protection. I mean, that's the lowest, I think, of the issues there. Probably one of the higher ones was traffic and the need to reconstruct this intersection. And I think we had some discussion about the high traffic count and putting the stress on this intersection. So I guess all of my comments are going to be <clears throat> with that caveat that this is a very challenging site. And I recognize that there have been multiple um, presentations from you from the applicant to us but understand that um we'll leave it at that so with that said um sean i'm concerned about pervious pavement there um what are you going to do to make sure that vehicle fluids don't get into the aquifer so it's it is filtered, and I've actually, I, mean, I was doing some research on that, and I can provide some documentation on that, but it was, there's recommendations where if you have a, um, not necessarily just a parking lot, but any sort of a high potential area for vehicle fluids, whether it's a truck wash area or some sort of maintenance type area that porous pavement or pervious pavement is discouraged, but it has been shown to capture that in the layers um, below the pavement to not infiltrate. But so when your, the to your question directly, I mean, there's no way to there's no way to necessarily monitor it or anything like that. Yeah, and, um, and that's what I'm concerned about. And the last applicant who was here, I actually they were going to do a. I feel like it was a gravel wetland and I asked them to line the gravel wetland. So in the event that um, there were some vehicle fluids that spilled or even um, oil, you know, like cooking oil spill from, um, I don't know if you have oil storage or heating oil or whatever, you know, it's obvious in the, in the ordinance that you have to have an SPCC plan, spill prevention control and countermeasures plan here. And um, there's also going to be some real issues with respect to protecting the aquifer that underlays the area. So a liner would be one way to do it, to, to basically intersect the transmission of pollutants down to the aquifer. This is um, because once you, once you um, contaminate an aquifer, that's really, really expensive. And, so, and so there, it is cleaned. The, the pervious pavement is, is cleaned to remove those. I'm really aware of pervious pavement. I'm just really wary of it. And I don't know that the DEP would necessarily, it's up to the DEP. I, I get that, that it's up to the DEP. But when it comes to our aquifer protection in Scarborough, you, you have to line it. I, I mean, it, it seems like you're gonna have to put a barrier or something there to, to protect the the aquifer so uh, I guess the, then you're trapping the water so somehow you have to release that water yep yep so you can't push on a rope <laughs> right. we just and talked about this there's before. no grade to work with on this site I mean the site's as flat as the floor in this room yep. so I mean it's not like yep. you can put a some other sort of treatment yep. there but, uh, so I'll, I'll leave you with that but also you know the buffering I guess how would we deal with buffering buffering for um, some of the concerns that we heard the, earlier so I mean, um, the the area of concern on the northerly side with headlights mm -hmm. I mean, our landscape plan does call for for plantings in that area um, 
Yeah, and Bob, I saw Bob get Metcalf had done this plan, the landscape architect yes. for, you, for you all. I think, was this, am I thinking of the right submittal? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So do you feel like what you have here would provide the um, visual buffering, the light buffering, um, the, 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 you know, the setback standards that we need? I think, it, so I think that would meet the, the setback standards. The question is, I guess, could more be done to screen headlights? Okay. On the, I, mean, I believe that calls for some trees in that yep. area. But this is a this is a really great start. This landscape architecture plan that you have here with Bob Metcalf is 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 a great start. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop with my comments and questions um, and look to my peers to continue on. Thanks, Robin. Um, it's always fun going first, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go ahead and generally and whether or not the board wants to take um, any any cue from this. Uh, I think there's so much here that needs to be vetted out, including uh, the most probably the most important piece of this project is that traffic movement permit and also better understanding what the redevelopment of that intersection is going to look like and how does your site fit into that redevelopment. The worst thing we can do is try to rush through a project into a site that's about to be redeveloped and find out that they don't mesh. And that's, that would be a huge mistake on our part as uh, you know, a responsible body of this, of this town. Um, and I think once there's a better understanding of one, the traffic impacts, and two, what that redevelopment looks like, and you have a meeting with staff, um, you know, and this is just my rule of thumb as I, and I've said this before out loud and it's not written anywhere, but it is my personal rule of thumb, is if somebody walks in with over five pages worth of notes, it tells me that they need to spend at least a little bit more time trying to get to the, the real bone of the issues with staff or have a little bit more back and forth before coming back to this board. I get there's a lot that you want input on, but we are as probably as blind as you at this point where it comes to a redevelopment of that intersection and how your plans fit in with it without any traffic movement information. Um, things like the architecture, while great, nice, you can see it. If you don't want to go to 20 feet, all you have to do is submit the waiver, and we consider the waiver request to 18 feet. So it's things like that where I think you cut down on all of these little things by a quick meeting with staff to go over some of these smaller detail items. Not that they're small and meaningless, it's just to, to get this into a point where we can really focus in on issues that are going to help you plan this site. Um, because right now I feel like there's just so much we could be talking about, we could be here for hours. Um, and, and guessing, and I think that's where I struggle with this, is not only could we be here for hours discussing a lot of this, we might be guessing at this point, which means a rehash of a lot of the things that we're going to be discussing again. And I'd hate to redo work. Um, yes, Robin. Yeah, and I would add that <clears throat> nine times out of ten, um, you're going to get the information that you need from staff, whether it's Angela, Jamel, Jay, or others. And um, very, it's those one in ten instances that you have to come to the planning board to say, oh, yeah, that, that waiver is fine or whatever. But, but you'll get the information you need from staff. It seems fairly technical at this point. If I could jump in, too, about the intersection, um, just so... You guys are aware and the board's aware um, the town has um, received and we've been working with our traffic engineers on a redevelopment or re yeah, redevelopment project for this intersection in town um, and we have full the town does have full funding um, to redo uh, the intersection not including your project um, in terms of lane configurations uh, traffic signal upgrades um, and there's also a sidewalk planned along the western side of Saco Street. Um, I guess folks from the campground up the road tend to walk down this portion of Saco Street uh, to go to the Dunkin' Donuts for a quick stop, whatever you may have it. Um, so, and I think the comment about coordinating with staff is if you're going to be rebuilding um, part of the road, I think the town will be looking for you to build that portion of the sidewalk. Um, given that you're not proposing any sidewalks along either frontage, as is typically required, um, or providing money to a fund. So I think 
just for coordination purposes, I think that's where that comment came from is uh, why build it twice when um, we're, the sidewalks proposed along the western side. So those are the sort of things that could be worked out with staff. We do have those plans in the planning office. Uh, we could talk about it and uh, get our traffic engineers together and, and go from there. So I guess I understand the, the board and I don't want to waste a lot of time, but it is a little unfortunate that we were here in May and nobody since then has said anything to us or shown us any preliminary plans or anything for what's improved at that intersection, knowing that this project was proposed in May. The first time we heard of that there was actually plans was in the comments that we received on Thursday. So I, I guess we had no known, didn't know anything to be able to coordinate anything before then. So those plans were, uh, were just finished within the last month or so. Um, so they're, they weren't complete then and we didn't know what the results would be, just, to, just so you know that. Uh, and then one other question that um, Jamal had just mentioned about building the sidewalk. So I went back through um, the ordinance as far as the town and um, when the developer is required to build a sidewalk. And um, from my understanding, it's if the area was designated as um, needing a sidewalk in the townwide transportation study, then the developer is required to construct that if it hasn't been built yet. Um, if one was not proposed in the transportation study, then the sidewalk's not required. But then it also says if, um, if the council has already designated funds to build those sidewalks, then the developer is not required. And it sounds like there's a plan already in place that funding is available for to build those. So I'm not sure why it would then be our responsibility to, to pay for that sidewalk construction. There is no funding for the sidewalks in this area. Um, it's just for intersection improvements. And that also came from um, during master plan. I'm, you guys had told the board that you were expecting a lot of walk up traffic. Um, which is why you proposed a sidewalk into the site um, that was in the record. So I guess we're a little, I'm a little confused as to what so you're expecting. Pedestrian, there is a walk-up window at the site because that's the sort of this model store includes a, a walk-up window. And I know that the issue was raised about potential people coming from the campground. I believe we added the sidewalk at the town or the board's request because there was discussion of that there was going to be sidewalks put in on County Road and the town requested easements from us to be able to put those sidewalks in. And if those were put in, then we would be required to have a sidewalk connecting to them. Um, we weren't proposing the sidewalk at the start. That was based on requests that came from the town. If there's sidewalks there, I think it's a good idea. Um, what I don't know is though the applicant would want to pay to build sidewalks for people to get there because the majority of their customers do come by car. They're not, they're not foot traffic. But. Sorry to keep jumping in, but I'm just trying to help. Um, I'm not saying that a sidewalk is going to be required of you guys, but re road reconstruction probably will be given your required left turn lane. Um, so just coordination. I don't think answering whether you are required to build a sidewalk tonight is appropriate. Um, I think we should just sort of meet offline and, and chat about that. And I think that's that's kind of where my head's at with this is I think it would really benefit both the applicant and staff to sit down and kind of work through some of this. That way the board, if there's no meeting of the minds on specific issues, then come to the board. We're going to talk about it. We do grant waivers. You know, we're not cold hearted. We understand there's a there's a financial aspect to all of this as well. But um, I also don't want to be put in a position to make a decision on uh, a development that is going to be a impacted through a traffic um, study that we we don't know what that intersection um, may or may not look like soon and I think a better understanding between the applicant and staff um, who we this board has not seen any plans for the detail or anything behind that so um, I really want to get this to a point where you're really using this board's time to weigh in on issues where you cannot meet um, or need our assistance that's where I'm, I'm at right now and I don't want to try to do the staff meeting here during the, the planning board meeting no I agree okay sure. so uh, I, I it was Angela and it's a, unfortunate that she's not here tonight um, that had asked uh, had had I had no idea that there's it's not 
an area that you would think of as being highly trafficked by pedestrians. Um, it was brought up to my attention. Um, but it was also Angela and, and Rick, you also weighed in on this, um, that had talked about leaving that right-hand turn lane, that, that driveway that is there now, leaving that for a future right-hand turn only. Um, and Angela had asked us to put that back into the study uh, or back into our master plan as a future right-hand turn to alleviate traffic uh, at that intersection. So, and now the, now the board is saying that they want that permanently removed. So I'm a little bit confused about that because it, we put it back in because you guys had asked us to put it in for future development. Um, so as I remember it, uh, we're, so for clarity, we're talking about the little gravel driveway. Yeah, um, where the right hand the ri On the go. master plan, it, it was much further up the street and associated with any potential future development. So I think those are two separate access points. And with traffic, I mean, this project requires a traffic movement permit with the state, which is yeah. lengthy, and um, a lot of details will come out of that process. So I think also working with the state through that process will really help to inform what's going to be required um, to the board as well. If I could just ask for, I guess, one thing for clarification on the board. The first item about needing renderings, because that's something, if it is something that the board's going to want to see, I don't want to make another submission either without it and, um, and then you're going to ask for it again or um, if it's definitely something that the board wants at least we could have it prepared for our next submission and and, uh, and include that uh, if I'll, you have any thoughts on that my my, my initial thought is that I'd, I'd like to see him anyone else yeah. are you talking about for the high district buildings help them regarding the, you know if we get a suddenly height of the building situation at least is that a big is that something you'd like to have resolved personally I can they need yeah I can too yeah they, they're, I'm sorry they it should be a full, it should be a waiver in request in your next submission is, mm -hmm. is what it really should be um, I'm okay with 18 feet just before we get to that formal process. Anyone else? I agree. I mean, why heat space that you're not going to use? Sure. They see your thermal envelope. You're not doing a hot roof, so you've cut it off at your ceiling height. I, I would, I'd leave it at 18. So I, I think the renderings comment was more of a, to look at the site from the roads. I don't think it had to do with the height. I don't think there were, was there a height on the elevations? Because like, I don't think there was. Yeah, was so we didn't know if it was 12, yeah. 15, 18, 35. And on the rendering, it's not going to make too much of a difference. It's more just a matter of do we need to go through the effort of creating renderings to incorporate all that or not. It seems to me that um, a lot of the answers are going to occur when the, you do your traffic study and also the uh, stormwater, you know, DEP. And Sorry, and talk to staff, Roger. Yo. Yeah, correct. That's that's why I kind of wanted to yeah. pump the brakes a little on how far this board went because I think mm. I, I think there's still so much that needs to be um, provided for information, <coughs> which uh, requires some some uh, outside departments, yeah. even at, at this time. So I think that information would help all of us a lot, including you as the applicant and staff uh, as we review this project. You know, the, the only other comment is, um, <clears throat> and I'm sure you know this, this is in that uh, town village complex, so we do have great, we have these grand plans for the future at some point, so. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's a challenging site, but to answer Mrs. Vance's, Ms. Vance's, um, uh, one of the comments she made, I, I suspect you're probably putting this this facility right there because of the traffic. You want to, you want to have a lot of traffic. So that's, that's the that's 22, I guess. Rick. One other thing, I noticed on your photometrics, you've got two halogen fixtures. Swap those out with LEDs. Sure. Give a cut sheets on those as well so we can yeah, see that. Yeah. I would note, I think there's something in your ordinance which 
specifically requires, um, I think it's halogen fixtures, which I'm assuming that was something old in there that you would want LEDs, but. Um, no, put the LEDs. Um, we want the LEDs. Yeah. Uh, for what it's worth, um, as you go through your discussions, I'm comfortable with the five future parking spaces being delineated on your plans, paving only the five and leaving those in there as, as depicted. Any of the board members concur, disagree on that one, just as they go forward as they plan their parking spaces? I'm fine with it. Jen, I'm, I'm, fine, with it. I'm fine with that, but you may want to take a, a second look at the grading. It doesn't look like the, the site grading was designed as proposed to accommodate those spaces, which would mean that if and when you you were to go and um, build those out, it would just be more disruptive um, and require more site work. Very good point. Nice catch. Okay. So we will await to see you after uh, some more meetings. Okay. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda is the Caffeinated Pig LLC requests a site plan review for one Bridges, Bridges Drive Assessor's Map RO39, Lot 24. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is, we're now moving on to the B3 zoning district at the corner of Bridges Drive and Payne Road. And the applicant was last before the board in November uh, for a sketch plan review. Uh, the applicant's proposing a 1,000 square foot coffee shop, again, with drive through lanes, parking, and landscaping uh, provisions. Um, again, staff has noted that the project will result, result in a significant amount of vehicle trips being added to another ve very busy corridor here in town. Staff, the town's traffic consultant, and the applicant have begun discussions about potential off-site improvements that will fully mitigate the impacts generated by the proposal, particularly left turns in and out of Bridges Drive. The town's public safety departments continue to express concerns about adding such a significant number of vehicles uh, to this already pro problematic intersection. This project will also require a traffic movement permit uh, with the main DOT, and given that the Scarborough Downs uh, project also requires a traffic movement permit, a coordinated effort moving forward uh, has been suggested. This project is also subject to the town's commercial design standards. Uh, staff has pointed out uh, standards that apply, including corner building and facade treatment standards, and again, um, the request for renderings so the board can view the site um, as seen from Payne and Bridges Drive. Staff would like to note the applicant is proposing to provide nine parking spaces instead of the required 10, so you'll need to uh, provide direction on if you feel comfortable with the proposal uh, with the nine spaces as proposed. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. The applicant would like to try again. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, Sean Thies with CES representing the applicant. Um, and um, I apologize, we were here last month for sketch plan due to deadlines for submission. Um, nothing that we heard on sketch plan has been addressed on this plan because we had to submit our application the same day. So I don't want to waste a lot of time, I guess, rehashing comments that we've already heard from you. Um, we plan to, plan to address that uh, information. Uh, we have since um, met with the uh, town staff and the uh, traffic peer reviewer to discuss uh, some of the traffic concerns. And we have our scoping meeting with uh, the town and DOT on Wednesday um, to review some of that information on traffic uh, with DOT. So um, I think we have an understanding of everybody's concerns with the traffic um, here. And uh, hopefully after we meet with DOT, we'll have some uh, better direction and I think the conversation with the town was pretty good with some uh, um, possible um, improvements that can be made to address traffic so um, and I guess I'll, I'll I guess just briefly I guess for the uh, people in the audience um, benefit since they weren't here in November um, similarly a thousand square foot uh, drive-through coffee shop access is off of Bridges Drive we've located the uh, the entrance to the facility as far back away from Payne Road as we can uh, to allow um, more uh, traffic stacking in that area. Um, there is a an existing uh, main DOT drainage easement from a culvert that crosses the end of Bridges Drive and empties onto the site. Um, our initial discussions with 
main DOT was that we could change the grading to redirect that easement around the uh, be the east end of the site, but they wouldn't allow us to extend the pipe to fill that in. So that's the reason you see a lot of grading on that end between there and Payne Road. Um, it was suggested the, the town was supportive to extend the pipe, so I believe that's going to be discussed at the scoping meeting to see if we can get some um, agreement from DOT to allow that. Uh, if that was the case, we could fill in a lot of that area down to uh, where we show a, a level spreader, um, sort of fill that area in and provide some better landscape buffering uh, between that end of the store and Payne Road. Um, the way it is now with that extensive grading, we really don't have an opportunity to do a lot of uh, large plantings. Uh, we have included a landscape plan now, and I believe there's some plantings along the top of that slope, but it's more um, shrubbery, low growth type plantings rather than uh, any sort of trees. Um, beyond that, um, I did have some questions on on staff review that um, um, a lot fewer, I guess, than because um, a lot of these comments were similar to what we saw at sketch plan and we just haven't addressed yet. Um, so again, we're going to discuss the, uh, the plantings uh, with DOT. Um, the pedestrian ways section, uh, similar to um, uh, what we had discussed on the last project, there was a comment about uh, allowing the applicant to um, contribute funds to some sort of an account for improvements elsewhere. Um, where this is located, I don't believe the, the traffic plan or the um, traffic study had included sidewalks in this area. So based on the ordinance, it doesn't appear to me that the developer is required to build sidewalks. And I don't see where there's anything in there that says if you can't or if there's not proposed to be sidewalks there, that in, in lieu of that you pay to build sidewalks or some other improvements elsewhere in town. So some clarification on that um, would be helpful. Um, there was a comment on the landscape plan about some trees in that narrow strip between the, uh, the drive aisle and then the parking that's on the north of that. There's a, a landscape strip there and potentially some larger shade trees. Uh, we have our septic, our, our septic tanks, our pump station, and then our force main line all runs within that area. So it's not a, an area where we would want to put anything within um, uh, large uh, roots going in too far into the ground that's going to interfere with our utilities. So that was the reason why there's, there's no trees uh, currently shown there. And the only other comment, there was a comment about a double row of erosion control and construction fencing. Um, and this is something that we can discuss with probably staff, but um, I would, I don't have a problem with the double row, but I would assume that silt fence could be uh, used in lieu of construction fencing rather than two rows of erosion control plus a construction fence at the, at the limits of disturbance at the toe of that slope. But uh, in general, that was, the only questions or comments I had on the on the review memo. Thank you. Um, we do have an opportunity for public comment this evening on this item. If you would like to speak, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, Roger, would you like to? Um, uh, yeah, I have a general question for you. Um, it pertains to both this property as well as the one we just uh, discussed, and it's the previous um, um, you know, drive parking and everything. Um, kind of curious how you decided to go with that. Because, and my, my thought process on that is when the Acura dealership was before us, that came up and they decided, they indicated they didn't want to go that route because of um, debris and sand and things working its way down through and clogging up the system. So I'm kind of curious how, you know, why you decided to go with this so we're very limited on this site for space to do any sort of if you want to say more conventional 
stormwater detention type uh, measures. I mean, we're already, um, we have a wetland application, a wetland fill application into DEP. Uh, all that fill on the north side is into wetlands. So any additional space that we would need for uh, stormwater detention would take up, would push us further into the wetlands. Um, we decided to use the porous pavement. Um, it's a little more expensive uh, construction wise, but it offsets the need for um, those other footprint, say, if you will, uh, stormwater areas. Um, you can't put sand in it for a sort of a, an ice treatment. It's a salt only, so you don't want to sand it. Um, and then there's other requirements as far as uh, for maintenance. You have to use a vac truck and come in and vacuum up any of the debris and things like that. But um, I can't speak, I guess, to why they chose not to use it or what their what they had on their site for other space available for other options but um, that's why we chose to use it on, yeah. on this site um, you know this is I mean I, I, I understand your rationale you know it, it makes sense to me but uh, I just kind of curious as to what your, your thought process was on that um, <clears throat> it's interesting these two sites I mean this is such a challenging site due to the traffic in the way that your the arrangement is, um, and um, I guess I guess we have to wait and see how that turns out. Yeah, so um, these buildings are, are pretty standard, aren't they? The Aroma Joe building. Yeah, so they have uh, a few different models. Yeah. Uh, depending on depending on sites, uh, this is sort of, I believe, what they selected as their most efficient model. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they have this and the other site, it's, uh, it's the same model store. Yeah. And so the building plans are all the same as what you've seen. I guess I'm all set right now. Thanks, Roger. Jen. Um, yes, okay, sorry. I'm looking at that here. Um, so, Jamal, I don't know if you may know more about this or not, but um, as also as a member of the town's uh, transportation committee, I know that at the last meeting that we had, um, what's today, Monday, so that would have been last Tuesday, um, we met with Jay to sort of talk about um, the issue that you brought up regarding sidewalk construction in lieu fee of um, and where where all that happens um, around town and just to sort of work through a little more clarity for both uh, the, the planning board, the transportation committee, um, the town in general, and for um, applicants and developments that come in. So literally an ongoing conversation, um, but I think I thought that we had a good uh, conversation and good questions around it, at least from a trans transportation standpoint. And my understanding leaving that meeting was that um, staff were going to work on a little more uh, clarity to that end, addressing this the exact uh, concern that you brought up. You want to jump in? Please. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's definitely ongoing, and the zoning ordinance does require pedestrian provisions to and within uh, sites in the B3 zoning district. So staff sees that as I'm not sure what other pedestrian amenities could be provided other than sidewalks to a site. Um, so typically the sidewalks are, for, you know, expected along the, the site's frontage or the town council did uh, generate or create this multimodal reserve account to be, for funds to be put into to coordinate with pedestrian infrastructure in close proximity to a site if putting a sidewalk to nowhere makes no sense. So that's where that comment has also come from. I'm just, I guess, going by the wording in the ordinance, and I'll, I, I can read it exactly here. If a sidewalk does not exist in the street adjacent to the site, but the town has identified the construction of a sidewalk for this portion of the street in the townwide transportation study, March 2005, the applicant shall be responsible for the construction of a sidewalk along the full width of the frontage or in a location otherwise determined by the planning board. And that's the site plan review ordinance. I was referring to the zoning ordinance. Okay, but 
so the transportation study didn't identify a sidewalk along this section of Payne Road or Bridges Drive. So when I read that, it seems pretty clear that if it's if it didn't identify one, then the applicant's not required to build one. I mean, it doesn't say that you're not required to build one, but you are required to provide funds to build one somewhere else. So, I mean, if it's if it's somewhere else in the, I found that based on the review memo as far as the section that was referred to. So, if it's somewhere else in the in the ordinance, I guess. The, We'll, we'll review that, but uh, I don't know what the practice has been in the past for projects like this, if there's no sidewalk and and none was proposed, that if there was some sort of a think, payment to some other I think this account, goes but. right to what Jen was saying, which is we hope to provide some clarity because yes. as Jamal's pointed out, the zoning ordinance does state we need to provide for pedestrian access and um, what's the exact word? Uh, to and from the to and, yeah. to and from. So as, as Jamal's pointed out, is, does that mean sidewalks um, per the zoning ordinance and then you have site plan um, ordinance language so as Jen has duly pointed out yeah. we need to clarify and help out we're, we're talking about it too yeah. okay so um, again that's probably another point we can try yeah. to work out as we go sure um, most of the rest of my comments really really uh, comments or questions really hinge on um, the offsite mitigation here and probably what will end up being part of your conversations this week with the DOT regarding your traffic movement permit. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's a big secret that this intersection doesn't function well today without this development here. And so um, just very curious about what comes out of that scoping meeting in terms of DOT's recommendations for um, improvements, queue lengths, lane widths, things like that. Rick? Yeah, um, I would ask if you might check with your lighting expert. Uh, you're over the mins and the maxes on the IES standards for, for this uh, plan. And the average is, is three tenths of a candle watt on average over. So maybe we can select different fixtures or something to reduce that a bit. Um, and you've got that halogen in this one too. Pars 30s, get rid of the pars. Don't ever say par 30 again. You'll be on. You'll be all set. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I'd have to wait um, on some of the other stuff based on what we hear uh, when they come back. Um, they are asking for a 25 foot versus a 26. So maybe we should provide some clarity for that. Um, that and um, if all of you can quickly up or down nod with uh, the parking space, you know, they're, they're proposing nine at this point. Yeah, I think uh, that's is this what you want? nine's okay with the board. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. It's got some good nods there. And um, also the 20 foot is part of the standards here as well. And, and um, I don't know what this one was drawn out at. If it's 18 again, I would. It's the same as the other one. I would say that I'd be all right with 18. And I think, uh, interestingly enough, I think we did kind of nod on that one last time through for this project, um, for this Aroma Joe's. I think we all kind of said 18 was probably just fine, um, which didn't carry over to the last project. So um, I, I think everyone's comfortable with the 18. Just that formal waiver portion completed. Um, I'm good. That's it, Rick, uh, Rick DeBerry. Would you like to jump in? Yeah, I just have a couple questions. Um, one is the snow storage. I can't remember where you said you were going to store snow. Right to the uh, west of the entrance, that clouded oh, area. Okay, I'm looking at the. Okay, so you, you probably may, depending on the severity of the winter, might end up have to do some snow removal and stuff. You're probably all aware of that. Because yeah. that's going to, you know, that potentially, depending on how built up that gets there, you could end up 
blocking the view of the people that are trying to turn out. You know what I mean? Yeah, as I mean, where it's identified, it's quite a ways back uh, yeah. from the road. But yeah, that that could grow over time as more snow piles up, and we just have to remove okay. it if it became an issue. Um, and then yeah, that is a challenging intersection there, and I know we're doing. Um, I know you haven't got your DOT traffic movement permit yet, right? No, we have our scoping meeting on Wednesday okay. with DOT. We had met last, okay. uh, sorry, not last week, the, I think the Friday before last uh, with town staff and okay. town's peer reviewer. And then kind of to piggyback on what Roger said about the, and, and, and I'm hoping I know Robin's going after me, which I'm glad because I don't really understand, you know, in the past we've seen stormwater filtration systems and um, you know I'm used to those now because I've been looking at them for the last three or four years but I don't completely understand how the how the actual pavement filters the oil and the antifreeze and the you know whatever's leaking out of cars um, you know and I know you've got roads right right there that cars drive on every day but um, normally in the past when we've seen these this type of construction this this is you know a stormwater pond and a stormwater attention and stormwater treatment and, and I'm just not seeing any of that so this must and, I, and maybe it's just a new technology that I'm not aware well I guess of, uh, is it pretty well why one thing that's different on this site as opposed to the other one we're not in an aquifer overlay zone we're not required to provide stormwater treatment other than I think uh, to the best of our abilities I mean formally we're, we're only required to meet the flooding standards um, I right believe. And, I'm, and I'm referring to this this site is because I was actually looking at the wetlands mm -hmm. more than the um, and the the fact that this one looks I think you're into I, I haven't walked that site but it appears that it sits kind of up on a hill and then the wetlands are yeah so up close to bridges drive it's up high with the road and not too far off the road it it drops off down to the wetland area yeah and this surface will filter out the contaminants before they get into the wetlands that's the idea it's the idea but it's more for storage of the water's going down, it's storing in a stone layer underneath the pavement. There's an under drain system on this design. So it's it's detaining the storm water so we can meet the, the pre-development flows off the site. Again, it's not specifically designed for stormwater treatment um, because of the size of this development and the location of it. Um, we're technically not required to provide treatment. Okay. Well, I'm, and I'm not a, a stormwater. Uh, I, yeah, can you? Thank you. All right, so you have to provide, there's water quality and there's water quantity. And so are you saying that you're using the pervious pavement to rectify the quantity issues here? Correct. And you're not meeting the flooding standard yet, correct? On the 10-year storm event, I think we're 0.05. And CFS over. So and are you meeting the 25 year storm event? We meet the 25 and we meet the two, two okay. years. Okay. The 20, uh, I'm seeing here in the, the, the Woodard and Curran page two says that according to your hy HydroCAD, the level spreader, um, the last bullet uh, above public private utilities says that it, it is overtopping. The level spreader further down is overtopping. So I think what we need to consider in this area, Sean, is that this is sort of a flood-prone area, and so maybe thinking about something other than porous pavement is needed, whether it go underground and you talk to our friends and the, you know, stormwater underground people, um, of which there are many around here that we could talk to. But if we're not meeting the, you know, the 210-25, then we're not, we're not controlling the quantity let alone the quality at this point. So I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah, we should talk about we'll, it with staff. We'll revisit the 
HydroCAD model and see if we can make some adjustments to yep. fix the 10 years. And long. just understand that, you know, pervious, pervious pavement definitely has its place, um, but I'm not necessarily sure that unfortunately these two sites may not be the appropriate place for it. And the other thing I wanted to just mention to you is that the, um, you know what I'm holding up here, right? From the stormwater maintenance and BMP logs. Yeah, yeah um, so, um, Scarborough is in an MS4 area, and so the MS4 clusters are working on better inspection, both during and post-construction. So you may want to talk with staff to get the, the post-construction inspection logs and reference those instead of um, these ones from DEP. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Robin. Rick, were you well set? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think they've covered the bulk of uh, what it is. Staff, is there anything that you want to help, uh, want us to help clarify um, before this goes away? Um, I guess I'd ask the applicant if they're okay with the remaining comments um, that were not mentioned. Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, other than the ones that I specifically um, asked or mentioned um, the other ones were ones that we'll look into and address and and make the changes to okay. and good luck on your meeting Wednesday I think that's going to tell you a lot um, we 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 await the day that Aroma Joe's arrives with a easy site to work with <laughs> um, I guess is, is there any thought if we're going to be making changes to the landscape plan where, where I mentioned the trees along that center center island uh, that narrow strip there, it's fairly narrow, and like I said, all of our utilities run through there, so I'd really rather not put trees that are going to have roots getting down into those areas. Is this on the easterly side of the property? It's, it's right down the center, so you can see from the, the west side of the building, that, that narrow strip right there, we have a septic tank, a grease trap, and a pump station, and then a force main that goes out to the leach field. I'm fine with and one of the review comments was to plant trees in that area. What are you doing to stabilize the the um, so sloped area? Are you doing vegetation that, or are you doing? It's going to be vegetated, and that was one of the review comments from uh, uh, Water and Kern was to provide additional information as far as stabilization of that slope. So we'll address that. That case. could be that could be an area a way to get some. Uh, more robust or augment the the landscape plantings on the on there. Um, did I, am I addressing your question at all? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're wondering about trees in the median and whether or not you really need them because they'll interrupt the subsurface utilities. Yeah, essentially we we'd be planting a tree right on top of our right. forest main where the roots right. are going to be growing down into right. the ground. And I'm saying. Are you trying to put the trees somewhere else? Because I was. Well, we have trees along Bridges Drive. Mm -hmm. I think we have. Um, um, I'd have to go look at the landscape plan. We don't have trees on that slope's a two to one slope, so we don't have. We have vegetation proposed on there, but we don't have trees proposed there. Well, um, you don't. Okay. Hopefully, so. if uh, DOT will allow us, uh, based on our meeting, if we can extend that pipe, we can provide additional plantings sort of more at the corner intersection of, of Payne Road and Bridges Drive. Mm -hmm. um, but you, yeah, you can see on here where we're showing mm -hmm. the plantings and, and, no, and you that, might that not island is put... planted, yeah. it's just not trees. Right. I, I can live with no trees there and other shallow rooted. I, I would just encourage him to explore other plantings other than maybe trees and you know, you can put other things on a, on a slope to help stabilize it as well too. So yeah put the trees or the plantings wherever they might land. Roger, go ahead. Uh, no, I just wanted to make a general comment if I could. Yeah. Um, regarding this property and the other one, I think you're facing the double whammy of what, I mean, what we face in Scarborough and that is traffic problems and, and uh, geography, the land. And you guys, are, you guys are really getting hit with it, so. Don't be discouraged, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll look forward to seeing it uh, next time when you get the traffic uh, movement information going. Thanks.
We are going to take a five minute recess before getting into our next item.
the tev televised audience is back. Oh, so we shall come back into session, please. All right, so our next item tonight is SKS TVS Holdings LLC requests a site plan review for the Downs, Lot 6, with the Innovation District Assessor's Map U53, Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as you all may recall, the applicant's proposing a 10,000 square foot warehousing and office building located on lot six within the Innovation District subdivision at the end of an unnamed uh, private drive. This lot has been identified as a back lot in the district's regulating plan. Uh, the applicant was last before the board in November, maybe November, for a sketch plan. Um, so the plans continue to depict pavement extending to the edge of the westerly, southerly, and easterly property lines on the site. During the sketch plan with the board, the applicant indicated that a similar layout may also be possible on abutting lots, which would result in a continuous paved surface with no separation provided between uses. The board requested that the applicant consider minimizing the amount of impervious on the site uh, where possible during sketch plan. Staff has recommended that the applicant consider a narrower drive aisle, which would result in less impervious cover and would also provide the opportunity for landscaping and buffering between abutting properties. Another option could be to provide shared access to these lots, which would also be more consistent with the regulating plan uh, for the Innovation District. So staff is looking for the board's input on this element. Staff recognizes that the applicant did modify the entrance to the site, but public safety, engineering, and planning continue to have concerns about the proposed design of the off-street parking adjacent um, to the private drive and future development of lot seven. The board requested an alternative design during sketch plan that seeks to limit this potentially dangerous turning movement. And again, uh, staff sees as another option here would be to provide for shared access to the abutting lot, um, which is consistent with the regulating plan. And as requested, the applicant did include several tree plantings uh, to the rear of the property to help soften the site's appearance from the op active open space area to the north. There still appears to be an opportunity to provide additional buffering uh, within this area of the site. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, the applicant like to please introduce herself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm with St. Clair Associates. And we're here tonight on behalf of <coughs> SKS TVS Holdings LLC uh, to present to you a 10,000 square foot building uh, located <coughs> on lot six of the Innovation District. And I would ask you all uh, just to turn to the cover sheet of the packet so we can take a look at where Lot 6 sits in the grand scheme of the Innovation District. Uh, so in the cover sheet, you'll see that Lot 6 is on what would be off the northwest end of the private shared private access and utility <coughs> easement that we spent so much time talking about over the last several uh, meetings, although we were down at the uh, southerly end of that. Uh, so we are at the northerly end of uh, that shared private access uh, and utility easement that shares um, uh, not only lot six, lot seven to the uh, east, lots 11 and 12 to the south, and uh, 28 and 29 uh, further south on Innovation Way. So we're talking a little bit about sort of the end configuration of that. Uh, right-of-way, if you will, that private way, uh, and how access happens. And it's a little bit uh, unique. We will give you uh, that, that we'd like to be able to discuss that a little bit further with you uh, as part of our plan. So, But first of all, I wanted to just sort of give you a little bit bigger picture uh, on that. So, Jamel, if you wouldn't mind going to the site itself now. As we mentioned during the sketch plan review, this 10,000 square foot building is actually home to Zoom Drain, which will be the, the primary use uh, for the building. They have office space and they also have a garage space uh, as part of that. They, can, they uh, occupy just a little bit over half of the building and the remaining half will be uh, set up basically in a similar fashion to their garage uh, where there are overhead doors on both sides of the buildings. What that allows for Zoom Drain is the ability for them to uh, take their larger vehicles, which do have uh, w freshwater tanks in them. They're about 200 gallons in each of the, the vehicles. Allows them to be able to keep them in the garage at night, especially during the winter months, uh, so they don't have to constantly empty that tank to avoid the water freezing in it. So um, that's an opportunity for them to be able to uh, store their vehicles in it, and it also is configured such that they can drive in and then drive the vehicle out uh, on either side. 
The tenant space is laid out the same way. There's actually two uh, general tenant spaces beyond that, both with an overhead door on either side. Those are on the northerly end of the building. That space can be further divided, so there could be up to four tenants, basically putting a wall uh, in the middle of the building, if you will. Uh, so each smaller tenant space would have an overhead door uh, access into it, rather than a through configuration. The circulation around the site, uh, one of the staff comments was to look at uh, opportunities to reduce the extent of impervious area on the site. There's a few things we need to accommodate on that, and I do know that one of the comments was to look at a one-way configuration and circulation pattern around the site. Um, based on the type of use of the site, based on the use of the building itself, especially with the overhead doors on either side of the building, uh, the one-way circulation pattern is not something that would be functional for the applicant or uh, even their prospective tenants on that. So we would like to keep the two-way circulation configuration on the site. We have taken a look at the maneuvering for a fire truck uh, going around and maneuvering through the site. Uh, the zoom drain trucks themselves, uh, they're a little bit bigger than um, like a UPS size uh, truck, but that needs to go in and out uh, of the building. So the edges of pavement, as you see on the sides of the plan, are based on that configuration of allowing a truck to be able to maneuver into the overhead door, into the garage, and then exit and come out of the site. In addition, um, we don't anticipate a heavy use of trailer trucks on this site, but there may be an occasion when a trailer truck does need to maneuver around the building as well. So we try to accommodate those. One of the comments that uh, was received was to provide the auto turn simulations uh, for staff review, and we'd certainly provide that so that everyone can take a look and see uh, with that. Based on our analysis of those uh, configuration patterns, there may be an opportunity to reduce the drive aisle width, which is right now at 25 feet, uh, which is consistent with the site plan requirements. Through a waiver process, we would potentially be able to ask you folks for a waiver to go down to 24. And we think we may be able to save a little bit uh, in the maneuvering uh, with that, a little bit of the reduction of impervious area. But um, given the configuration pattern that we have on the site, um, that's sort of where we're at uh, with that. In addition, one of the comments that was received was with regard to uh, the proximity of the pavement, especially on uh, the southerly, the westerly, and the easterly sides of the site. So on the westerly side of the site, we abut the wet pond number one. Um, so we're not uh, in any way um, having the potential that there's going to be another site use directly adjacent to us. On the southerly side, uh, that is lot 11, uh, which is in the uh, uh, subdivision, is obviously a developable lot. The applicant actually has an option on that piece of property. So to address the comment about the shared use and access, we believe that that is a good potential for that, especially with the applicant's interest in the adjacent property uh, as well. So that's why it's sort of situated uh, as it is on the southerly side of the site. On the westerly side of the site, adjacent lot seven uh, is where I believe you folks have had some comments about uh, the parking and the access coming in off of the end uh, of that private way. So if you look at our plan, you'll see that there's sort of a white block on the what would be the southeast uh, corner of the site. Uh, Jamel's pointing it out right there. So that was the original envisioned end of pavement as part of uh, the shared private access and utility easement. From that white block down to the property limit uh, of lot six is about 50 feet. So the option for an access to uh, lot seven on the easterly side of the site uh, would be to have the same type of configuration of a driveway within that 50 feet, just sort of the mirror image of it, as the southerly driveway on the property. If the use on Lot 7 uh, comes forward and needs to have a wider or a larger configuration, uh, there is the opportunity, you can see that there's a dashed line a little bit further up, probably about at, um, well, it's at the end, a little off the end of the six parking spaces that are shown on the side. That's the actual uh, end of the easement that was shown on the original subdivision plan uh, for that. So there would be some opportunity there 
to have uh, an access to that lot in that location. If that happens, the configuration of the pavement in that area would be a straight projection of that 24-foot pavement straight up shared on either side of the property line. And the stripe that is shown on the plan uh, would shift over to the common property line. So you would still have the 24 feet of full pavement to provide an access there. And those six parking spaces would be a full 13 feet past that uh, two-way configuration. Uh, so right now we show it as a transition because we simply don't know what will happen on lot seven, uh, but there is an opportunity uh, if that access were to extend basically the full extent of the uh, easement. We do believe that there is ample room uh, to provide for a full access and to have our parking remain as it is. So uh, as you see on the plan uh, right now where that begins to taper onto the site, there's an additional 13 feet from the full two lane, 25 foot wide drive aisle that transitions to at its uh, minimum point, if you will, 25 feet, which is the, the typical two lane uh, access on a parking lot. So um, we, as you know from the sketch plan to now, we've made that modification in order to uh, hopefully address what you folks had for concerns about that. But I'd certainly like to discuss what other uh, concerns might be had and what we might be able to do to address those uh, in that particular area. We have received the staff memoranda, we, which includes the, the technical memoranda from uh, Woodard and Kern, as well as the uh, traffic review by uh, Mr. Bray. And I did want to talk to you a little bit about the traffic impact fee uh, and uh, ask you folks to uh, discuss with us a request. Uh, with regard to the calculation of the 32 trips uh, in the PM peak hour, um, we feel that that's high and it was based on a projection of the unknown uh, space in the tenant spaces. So what we would like to uh, have the board uh, give consideration is that we have the opportunity as a tenant comes along to actually sort of check in on that number and actually pay that impact fee based on an actual tenant use uh, because we do feel that it's pretty heavily projected uh, based on the fact that uh, we're expecting these tenants to be quite small uh, and to have a very limited um, trip generation rate uh, with that. So we'd like to basically phase uh, that assessment uh, based on the real known uh, tenant use as it comes forward. Uh, and that could be something that could be tied to uh, an occupancy permit or a building permit for the tenant space itself uh, as far as that. So we would like to get the board's uh, input on that uh, as part of that. And uh, a couple other just minor uh, sort of updates for you. We have had uh, approval by the Portland Water District uh, on the site. Uh, they have recommended a couple of minor changes based on their review of the private way uh, that comes down through, uh, as well as the specific service for this lot. Uh, and so we provided that to staff, but it, it didn't come in in time for you folks to be able to see it or for staff to evaluate it, but it is in your hands at this point. Uh, the sanitary district is scheduled to be reviewing this plan on Thursday. Uh, and so we anticipate that uh, those two items will have a, a sign off very soon uh, with regard to that. The last comment uh, that I wanted to discuss with you folks is with regard to buffering. And we've talked a little bit about sort of the surrounding uses uh, along the perimeter, but the north side was an area that was uh, discussed as far as providing for uh, additional plantings. There are uh, Norway spruce that are proposed along the northerly edge of the property. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that buffering was to help to um, sort of protect the, the trail that comes through there. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context on that whole buffering thing. So this is the approved subdivision plat for the Innovation District. And so the blue box that's on the plan is lot six. Right there. This red line is the outer perimeter of 
the Downs property. And that's all open space in this area here. And then um, you'll see along this blue line here, this sort of dashed line, is a perimeter buffer that is around the Innovation District itself. The, I hope you guys can see this, um, the green line that's right there is the existing trail that's in that perimeter buffer. And so uh, at its nearest point to the property line on the northwest corner of lot six, the trail is eight and a half feet. Uh, and that's where those Norway spruce were planted is in that northwest uh, corner. From the easterly property line, you can see that on the plan. Janelle has just brought that down. So that dash line is the uh, existing location of that trail. <clears throat> so on the uh, east property line, projection up of that line is 35 feet from the property limit. And at the midpoint, it's about 45 feet from the property limit. If you take those numbers from the edges of pavement, on the northwest corner were 81 feet, in the midpoint were 82, and on the east corner were about 70. So we have provided for that additional uh, buffering, if you will, with the addition of the evergreens uh, in those areas, but we do feel that given the location of the trail in that spot and given the extent of buffering and uh, perimeter green space that's around there, that we have um, provided what we feel would be ample uh, to protect that resource in that area, uh, as well as anybody who is, I wouldn't say nearby because they're really not. <laughs> Uh, so we wanted to talk to you folks a little bit about uh, that comment as well. Uh, we are here tonight to seek site plan approval. We do understand that we do have comments that need to be addressed, but we're confident um, that with those comments in our discussion tonight that those might be uh, addressed through a condition of approval. And so we'd like to talk to you folks about that. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we do have opportunity for public comment at this time. If there's anyone that would like to speak to the project, please get up to the podium, state your name. Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Um, so for this one, I think there's a couple of things we should specifically drill down on. Um, and I'd like to kind of take, take it topically just for the start. Um, and the first one that I really kind of want to hear the board weigh in on is the the access point, um, whether or not um, the board is comfortable with what they see as a proposal for the access point, uh, specifically as it relates to entry into the site and as it relates to the adjacent uh, property line, the uh, adjacent lot to it. The uh, thought being whether or not um, there should be maybe more of a separation slash buffering going on in a shared access drive versus what, what we can kind of see here. If the same plan was flipped around, then I think you look at a, quite a bit of impervious surface back there at the end of the lot. Um, so I think that'd be the first topic I kind of want to hear some board opinions on. And then after that, we'll jump into the next one, if that works. Jen, you look excited. confused I was trying really hard during your explanation to follow along and I just couldn't do it so um, if you wouldn't mind explaining to me what the part that I'm having a hard time picturing is is essentially um, this site in reverse on the lot on lot seven if that were the case um, how how does that operate as you are coming in um, just headed into these two sites. And so so the, I just drew like these four little arrows here pl playing that out. Um, I think what you were saying is that if, if an identical site or similar site were to show up on lot seven, um, the inbound, for lack of a better term, the, the inbound access for both sites would be to the to the right of the property line that you're currently talking about. Do I have that right? Uh, and because otherwise, to me, it looks like you have the opportunity for double crossing of both directions of traffic. And I'm sorry if I'm not doing a good job explaining that. Um, 
if you look at this as almost like a leg of an intersection, it would, to me, be a full four-way intersection. Okay. So if you were at that, so if you were at that four-way intersection, for example, and you were ultimately headed uh, to continue straight and then at the back of the site take a left and turn into this, the, the parking area that you're showing at the top of this building, would you be, would you be driving straight on the lot seven property or on the lot 11 property? If you, if you were coming into the site at that T intersection, that full mm -hmm. four way intersection, you could make an immediate right and enter into the site, circulate around the building similar to what is shown on that plan. If you were to proceed to the north of the site, there would potentially, if you wanted to have a second access point, you would proceed centered on the common lot line of the two lots. So as I mentioned, that striping, that striping would shift to the common lot line. Okay, so, so, so the lot line, for, for argument's sake, would be, would act like a double yellow? Essentially, yes. Okay. So it, we've, we've got to keep in mind that these private shared access easements span the lot lines. Understood. So the lot lines Understood. are on the center line of this 50 foot wide uh, shared private access and utility easement. And, do, and does that require, I'm assuming that requires coordination between the two properties? Yes. Okay. So with, again, just complete devil's advocate, I'm guessing that this is not even, you know, it's not close to what you would be looking at here because the types of businesses that we've seen to date and probably those that are in the queue are coming here for some of these reasons because of some of, some of these, you know, special features, we'll call them. Um, but, but in the interest of, um, you know, looking down the road, if it's a different, if it's a change in use or something like that, um, I'm, that, the way that that leg of that intersection operates or could potentially operate is a little confusing to me. And again, that may be because this is kind of the first time that we've seen this, um, but it just, it does just sort of seem like there is the potential for um, some conflicting movements that might not be desirable and that and and I'm saying that with regard to just sort of through traffic and access not even factoring in the the proposed um, parking that you have here adjacent to that to that aisle way and so um, that's that's like the biggest thing that's jumping out at me uh, in terms of this and I I heard you closely when you were explaining that you felt that one-way access for the site was not um, was not desirable based on the potential for dividing up this building into smaller tenant uses, um, but for the functionality of this space and some of the potential for com conflicting movements, I do just wonder if, again, having a single, even a single wide point of access um, in one-way direction around the building might help alleviate that. That's just what's running through my head. If anyone else wants to weigh in on that. Roger. Sure. <clears throat> just to expand upon what she was talking about, <clears throat> I'm looking at sheet three. And I, so on the private way, some vehicle heading into the into either lot six or seven would be on the right, would be actually entering in the property which is, lo which is lot seven, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And vice versa, ultimately lot seven, when they want to leave, they will be actually leaving on a portion of lot six. That is correct. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> that is the private way. Yeah. That okay. is the whole premise of it being a, a shared private access and utility easement that spans those six lots and is centered on the common lot lines. There, there is no dedicated, divided, <coughs> separated out right-of-way. It, it encumbers each of the lots. 
And as part of that, each of the lot owners knows and understands when they come into this district that they will need to share that right of access. They will benefit by it and they will have to share it. So everything that is within that 50 foot corridor that extends all the way from this lot all the way down to Innovation Way is a lot, is, is a piece of each one of those lots that is shared in common. And, and actually, lot six, when they're, when they're leaving, all lot seven, are, they're actually going to be driving through lot 11. That is correct. Yeah. And this will be pretty much what we'll be experiencing throughout the whole development. On the private ways, that is correct. Perfectly clear to me. <laughs> I have another question. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, um, so I understand that. My question: is, Why not? Why not show that now? What why, why not show that shared access with Lot Seven now? It is. I'm not sure what you're saying. But you're not showing. Um, you're only showing it shared with lot seven for a very small portion of the site, sort of down again at the center of the, the four-way intersection that we were sort of talking about, um, versus showing the shared access all the way up through, uh, through the site. One of the, well, one of the reasons is we don't know what the need will be for that. And so we could build something artificially longer than it needs to be. Uh, the right of access is there. It's very clear that you know the applicant knows that there is the, the right of access that will come over that edge of the property within that easement uh, for that. But for us to sort of artificially build extra pavement, didn't feel that that was appropriate. We've, we've provided for what we feel is, at a minimum, an opportunity to come in if that end user needs more, there is an opportunity to add it and it's understood uh, as part of that site plan review process for lot seven uh, that that would be reviewed as part of that uh, evaluation, if you will. If I could jump in, it just, it just seems like there's confusion about what the future of lot seven is. So they could pretty much access anywhere, correct? They have, uh, at this point, their access point would only extend up to that dashed line uh, because that's the end of the easement that was shown uh, on the plan. There is an opportunity uh, to extend it if it needed to be extended, but that easement limit is what was shown on uh, the platted subdivision plan. And we have been asked to extend it by about 10 or 15 feet by the water district for the utilities, um, but that's the extent of what that is at this point. Uh, so there is some flexibility if it needed to have it in the future, but we've based it on what was shown on the original plan. I think one of the things that, I mean, the private ways in and of themselves as part of the Innovation District, I think we're all collectively still trying to work through sort of the, the process um, for that. This one is a little bit different in that we're at the end of one, uh, and how is it appropriately handled at the end? And so. We certainly, we feel that we've done an appropriate accommodation not only for this lot, uh, but for the adjacent lot seven. Uh, and any input that you folks have, we'd certainly take uh, as part of that process. One last question, and then I won't say anything else. I promise. Um, what's the, what's the distance? Uh, what's the width of the space that you are showing the? the pervious space between the edge of the paved line and the property line between six and seven. It looks very narrow, maybe like. The width of the space between the edge of pavement line of the lot line of the common lot line between six and seven? Right here? Yeah, right there. Uh, it's about a foot. About a foot, okay. And similarly to the south, it looks like a similar Correct. width left. And as we mentioned, that one has been set up such that um, a compatible use on that lot could share that access and come in if it needed to um, for that, which is consistent with what was schematically shown as part of the Innovation District and sort of shared parking and access off those sides.
Dan Baker with Scarborough Downs. Just have a question for me, the board and staff, around the concern about a shared driveway in front of those six parking spaces. It seems like that's a bit of concern as the potential for use by lot seven. And I guess for our benefit, we're trying to understand like what are those, what are those concerns? I mean, in terms of a site, this is generating 30 peak hour trips. So once every two minutes, there's a vehicle that'll drive past those parking spaces. The site next to it's going to be generating less because it's a smaller lot. Um, I went to Hannaford on my way here for dinner and drove through the Hannaford parking lot and you're going to have in each drive aisle five times more traffic um, than in a peak hour than you're going to have on that section of road. So in terms of conflicts, like we're trying to understand it's a private drive where there's shared access um, and we're trying to sort of, in some cases, duplicate use of that so you're not, we're not building parallel private drives to serve parking or parallel driveways to serve sides of the building. So from a light industrial setting and from a kind of concern around congestion, um, I guess the applicants are not seeing the congestion issue just based on the use, based on the context here and comparing it with retail site, an office site, this is a, it's a pretty sleepy end of the project. So we're trying to understand why this, I guess, doesn't work um, from a layout standpoint. Do you mind if I jump in? Yeah, I, th I think the confusion is, well, we've never seen this before, so <laughs> there's that. And if you look at these parking spaces, and it just looks like this could be, it could be like a 50 foot wide drive aisle if lot seven chooses to do so. Is that incorrect? It, 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 it just doesn't it, seem delineated. It's like, so these spouts are hidden behind this curb line. So it would almost make sense if the spots were close. I, I mean, I'm just, we just, we're just wondering why they aren't treated more than more like a like a Hannaford parking lot then they're just not designed like that I actually the comment that you made about sort of shifting them to the east I actually looked at that and to me it made more sense to keep them proximate to the building okay. and to provide just a little bit more of a um, apron area if you will uh, it works right now uh, to allow a full transition from the end and not artificially build extra pavement on lot seven if lot seven never needed to have that. Um, if lot seven does need to have an access up in that area, then yes, there would be some additional pavement behind those six parking spaces, but they are kept proximate to uh, the building and you do have your full 20, it would be 24 in that case because of the road, um, a 24 foot drive aisle uh, in there. Right now we have 25 at a minimum and it's uh, up to an additional 12 or 13 feet uh, at that island area. So we could shift it. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. But to me, it just it, it made it make more sense to stay where they were. Can I, can I, I, I do just a hypothetical. What if somebody buys lot seven in <coughs> lot 12? If they buy 7 and 12, their entrance may be further south and it may not be an issue. Right, but if that happens and the entrance is further south, what happens to that little triangle where lot 6 is currently encroaching into lot 7? You've got to remember that we're within that private 50-foot okay, wide all, right of way. It does not okay, matter. Fine. Okay. I'll add to the confusion. Um, I, th I think he, I think what you're hearing is we're having a very hard time visualizing how this plays out um, because we haven't seen it. You can't point to somewhere in town for us to go drive around and look at it. So it's very hard to visualize what this looks at built out, and and and, um, and you don't want to lay it all on the owner of lot six. 
However, we have to be very sensitive to how this operates within that whole area. I mean, it, there are impacts all around. Uh, I'll give you an example. The curbing on the southerly side of the property. So why? Why is there curbing? Um, you know, it's, it's like right on the lot line. Like, why are we doing curbing? And am I to expect to see all of this development just be asphalt? You know, why not a small buffer there? If you really wanted to break up a line between the lots, why is it a curb instead of a row of trees? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So well, I, I, I'm just, so I guess my biggest fear, what my challenge I'm overcoming personally is, am I going to be looking at all asphalt out there? That's, that's a ton of asphalt. And not just in this one drive, but everywhere else you go. Um, so for what it's worth, I think that's why we're, we're having a little trouble visually wrapping our minds around what we're about to see. Robin. Yeah, and just to add on that, I, I find I'm a little late to the party, but I'm finally starting to visualize it a little bit. And I think my question is, it's almost like you're, you want to have your cake and eat it too, meaning you want to have the two ways around the building still, and you want to be able to have, that's plan A. Plan B is you want to have the shared drive where you go and loop down and come back around the hairpin. And it and staff has asked to mitigate some pavement and there's sort of you know I guess the trouble I'm having is there's no give in that Nancy and because it, if you go with plan B let's call it the hairpin you know down and around kind of a thing I get that you could stop at the stop sign and turn left to go to the back side of lot six what we have now but it seems like if you want the hairpin, you could mitigate the, the pavement and just do one way around the building and come back to that four-way stop. And so I guess now that I'm able to sort of, th and thank you all to, m to my peers who have sort of gotten me to this far where I'm like, oh, I, I can kind of see it now. But I guess I'm, 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 I'm having trouble right now, too, with why aren't we thinking about one way around the building and maybe the applicant can, can talk with us about what benefits he and his company sees with needing to have plan A, plan B, and I don't know, maybe there's a plan C in here, too. But, um, it, and, and as Nick said, if you can show us somewhere too where this has, has worked, it doesn't have to be in town, can you come up with maybe it's being used in Portland, Oregon, or maybe it's being used in somewhere else, let us know. And, but, but understand too that this is an innovation district. We want to be innovative, but we also have to be really careful of, I don't know, precedent and that type of thing in, in this area here. And thank you very much for t holding our hand through this. So that is my concern at this point. Right. I get to go last. So I listened to everything everybody said. Jen, you did a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm still a little confused. But I also kind of listened to Mr. Bacon. And, and the whole time I was listening to the whole thing, in my mind I'm thinking that, yes, this is an innovation district, and we're doing things new. This lot's on the end. It's Zoom drain. I don't think that there's going to be, you know, it's, I don't think it's going to see the kind of traffic that, that we may be envisioning in our mind for, it, it's, it's a different, this is a different district and this is a different, these, these are different types of businesses that aren't necessarily going to see the kind of traffic that you might that, that that you could envision sometimes. So, um, I'm I listed every. I, I'm, I think I have it now. I'm like Robin in that I think I got it towards the end. Um, but I got a lot of it from what Jen was saying. But um, again, I mean, we knew we we knew with all the we knew this was going to be kind of different, and it was going to be the lot lines were going to be to the center. I don't, and it's on the end. So I guess my thoughts are that, yes, we want to make sure it's the best it can be, but um, I think we have to look at it a little bit differently than we would look at a normal, normal business. So 
I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I don't know if I did a very good job of expressing myself, but. Um. Nick. Yeah. Roger. Yes, uh, Nancy, can you explain again why you prefer the two-way going around the building instead of just the one-way? So the applicant has the ability to drive his vehicles in and out of the building. Mm. The tenant spaces have the same. The, the tenant spaces have also been set up that those two, which if you were a tenant, you could drive in one door and out the opposite side. Those can be also divided in half. So a tenant could have, a smaller tenant, could have the ability only to drive into the overhead door, but would have to back out and exit through the site. The configuration of looking at a one-way circulation we still need the apron area in order to allow the vehicle to come in and out of the building. So the only potential saving that you might have is on that north end to narrow it up. But we still have to get a trailer truck around it, and we have to get a fire truck through there. And if we made that one-way circulation, because we have the overhead doors, because we have vehicles coming in and out of the building, to me, it just seems like it's adding more confusion on the site than would be necessary. We still have to have those side aprons in order to allow a vehicle to maneuver and go through the overhead door and come back out. So, But, but if, uh, if you did divide up those tenants yeah. into smaller, you'd still have people going. They would still be going in and backing out. Mm -hmm. they, would be, they would be in and backing out if you Whether you, you were, had two-way or one-way. That, that is true. That is true, yes. And I would just suggest if, if you want us to consider that full build out potential, maybe show it to us so that we can envision that, what you're saying as far as splitting that building up into four, just show us so that we can, we can see. Uh, that would be a line through the middle of the two tenant spaces. Wouldn't be any change on the site. Put a tractor trailer. I mean, are you talking, you know, and you're talking about a truck having to back out? A truck right. does, a truck, if, if those tenant spaces were just a simple overhead door, a smaller tenant space, we wouldn't be backing a tractor trailer truck in and out of there. We right. We have to maneuver a tractor trailer truck around, around. the perimeter of the site. Yeah. Yes. The maneuvering area that we need is shown on the plan right now for the zoom drain truck to be able to turn and come into the building, exit the building, and turn and come out. Uh, so, Van, also just <clears throat> speak to one of the comments that was made about that southerly side again, um, why we are right up against that limit is, you know, as I mentioned, the applicant does have an interest in that uh, property to the south. So if you recall from the presentations on the Innovation District, one of the things that was looked at pretty closely was when you have that sideline, is that that's a shared access where there's parking on either side of it and it comes down uh, and is shared. So we laid that out so that uh, if, that applica if the applicant did proceed uh, with acquisition of that lot, that it would be laid out for that. If the applicant didn't proceed with acquisition of the lot, it's still laid out for a configuration similar to that. Um, so we tried to mimic what was presented as part of the uh, original schematics for the Innovation District with that sort of side property line being an opportunity to share uh, access and parking. Nick? Yes, Roger. Um, <clears throat> I think I understand what you're doing here. And um, I'm, I'm basically comfortable with the whole concept granted that it's new and it will, it will be establishing a benchmark for what we do in the future. Um, I, I guess, and on looking at this, there's a lot of pavement, okay? I don't know how you get around that. So if I want to keep, a, I want to keep in mind a couple of things. Um, in the innovation district, the lot sizes were purposely designed to be relatively small. Mm. There are a lot of them that are on the order of about 200 foot square. And when you're dealing with shared access uh, easements, when you're dealing with shared parking, you know, reducing all of that, sort of making it more compact, you're going to end up with what looks like a more 
uh, dense development, if you will. But there was 40, 50 acres of um, perimeter area throughout the site along buffers and that type of thing that was set aside as buffering in lieu of being able to have this sort of compact design. The approvals for the uh, Innovation District allowed for up to 85% impervious lot coverage on these lots. This lot is at 75%. So we're not at the allowable maximum, although it, it may feel like that uh, as you look at the plan. But the purpose of the plan is to be as, as uh, dense as we can, recognizing that we have all of these amenities that are throughout the project uh, that um, you know, are provided as an asset that not only is used by this lot, but all of the other lots uh, within the district. Uh, Rick Meinking, we haven't... Uh, I don't, think we I don't have a whole lot to add. I just, first, I appreciate you coming back here with an alternative. Um, the first set, we had some conditions that we wanted you to look at, and you did. Um, it does put a little queasiness in it because this is the first one, and, and uh, generally speaking, the business owner knows what he needs, and we don't know who's going to go in those vacant ones, so it's kind of an unknown, but it's going to be some, somewhat of a trades-type business. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to lose sleep over it, the way this has been set up. Um, I'd be curious to watch it, but... Generally speaking, where I'm coming from is uh, the beauty of Innovation District is just that. Let's see if we can get businesses in here that can all function together and work. And uh, I'd love to see that happen. And if it takes a little creative traffic engineering, uh, as long as it meets the straight face test by my colleagues, um, I'd be okay. So I'm not going to talk anymore. Thanks, Rick. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Jim. Your Mr. Chair. If lot, is that 11 to the south, right? If they were to share this access drive, would the plan for them be to also have 25 feet of drive aisle, or would their parking be right up to the edge? Or is yeah. that unknown? The detail of it is unknown. There is the opportunity for the parking to be off that lower edge of the existing edge of pavement right now. Okay. Thanks. So, by the curbing. <laughs> <laughs> it's stuck on that. Okay. I, if, well, especially since you have an option on the, the <laughs> southern lot, you would think at some point you might end up forcing yourself to tear it out later. That is, yes, I agree with you there. The purpose of the curbing is for the fact that it controls the stormwater getting to that basin that's shown in that corner and doesn't discharge onto the adjacent lot. Um, it is at the collection point for that. Uh, if the applicant proceeds, then that, that curbing is sort of sacrificial, if you will. But right now, it does serve a, a, a purpose. That's a better answer than I thought I was going to get. <laughs> Kudos on that. All right. Makes more sense. It's probably the better way to say that. Um, all right, so I, I really kind of need a, a head nod or something, whether or not the design you see in front of you, um, if this board finds it acceptable to move forward for that topic. Right. Yes, yes. I got three nodding heads. I got a no and a gen with uh, maybe. I, it's still a little unclear to me the the impervious percentages that you reference are helpful, but I also just kind of feel that um, just because you're not meeting, you're not at the 85% impervious doesn't mean that we should, I don't think it means we should just pave it because you still have room left in that in that calculation. Um, and I, I, I'm, I still, I still am unclear about whether or not 
this we could potentially see a, f a 50 to 53 foot driveway serving both of these um, parcels and the um, you know the, the parking and the maneuvering conflicts there concern me a little bit less than the width of that driveway potentially serving two um, lots that you recognized would generally be low um, traffic generators meaning they could probably get away with a driveway less than 50 feet wide um, but that also the the confluence of those movements back down at the intersection of those four lots is still a little bit uh, a little bit confusing to me so I wish that I had the opportunity to present a plan for <coughs> lot seven um, so that we could take a look at it I just don't have that opportunity mm -hmm. and I think that you know as you folks come to have the opportunity to review that perhaps some of the things that you're questioning would come to better light um, we have to proceed based on tying into what is a known and the known is that we are extending that private way up to the area that's sort of shown as that white section if you will we tried to make a reasonable point of access for the site that could be mirrored on the opposite side and we also had provided for an opportunity to tie in appropriately lane wise at the end of it uh, to come in and it did require a transition over I do understand that you know if we had the site plan available for lot, si uh, lot seven um, that would help to clarify things quite a bit. I'm not, con I'm not clear on your, t your 50 foot paved uh, question. Essentially, if, if the lot seven, if a lot seven development were to come in and, and mimic this development program in mirror, basically having the same width um, drive access but fully on the lot seven, or even as you stated, having um, the the um, the property line act as the center of that drive way, you would still have 25 feet on either side. So even if it was, you know, 25 feet headed in and 25 feet headed out, that's still 50 feet. Or it's 15 feet in and 25 feet out, still. Um, I'm just having a hard time picturing. If I, if I can weigh in real quick necessary. on that, because I think um, the look on your face is kind of the one I have the feeling in my stomach, which is I hadn't quite come to terms with the fact that this really is going to be all asphalt. And I think okay. per. I guess per I'm just what questioning does it really need to be that way? That's, and that's the sticking point, right? So if I sit here and give you my puppy dog look and go, can we please get a couple of like green spaces, like maybe a tree, like anything? Because you know what it is? It's the innovation district. It was going to be different. And we've done the whole, I'm going to pave the heck out of this property and just stop, plot buildings everywhere. We've seen that. And that doesn't appear innovative in my mind. And I'm having a lot of trouble getting to that point. But I am coming to the realization that this is going to be a lot of asphalt. And it's going to be there. And it's going to function like an industrial district. And that's what it is. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, and I think the sooner that we kind of understand that and beg for us to be innovative in some respects, just a tree here or there, you know? <laughs> Make it a, just a little bit different. Um, sure. I think there would be a little bit of a better feeling in my stomach and a, a better look on her face. So, so, Mr. Chair, that. if I could just add to that, I am yes. looking at the crossroads, the CPD zoning, um, section 20 C, uh, D, and it does say under access management that the development standards for each plan development must the address the issues of access management and interconnections. Direct vehicular access from individual buildings sites onto Route 1, Payne Road, or new collector streets within the district must be restricted. Site access shall be designed in accordance with site plan review ordinance. So to me, that says that we don't just abandon all the site plan review ordinances regarding buffers and and parking and, and that type of thing. It's let's let's get innovative. So um, and then if you look at open space network right above that, it does say that we want to include natural areas and green space and and the like. And I feel like we're missing a little bit of that. And I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because I understand that you have to. We can't we can't wait for lot seven and twelve to be bought and 
you have to help the, the landowner, but this is what we have to go by and to make sure that we're following this. And I'm gonna to continue to come back to this whenever we have a question like this in place. And at this point, I don't feel comfortable moving forward. So as we look at this site, this site is unique. It is, in, is you know, part of the innovation district. This site is not fronting on a public street. It doesn't have access via public street. It has vi access via a shared private access and utility easement that encumbers six lots, five of which you have to cross to get to this lot. And so as part of that process, there are certain specific site plan standards that we do apply uh, as part of it. The access coming off that private way is unique. It's not something that is the same as a public street. And we went through that at length with the um, prior site on Lot 28. In this particular case, we are in a totally different set setting, if you will, uh, than the last lot that was reviewed because we're at the end of this private way. We are trying to be cognizant of making sure we have sufficient maneuvering room for the site, making sure that we allocate and don't obstruct an access that would come onto the adjacent lots. But we are also keeping in mind the framework that was done as part of the innovation district to look at, for example, that access drive on the southerly side to be able to put parking on the opposite side of it to benefit the adjacent lot. I, so, I agree, but let's not forget that there's, there's a streetscape treatment too that's right below section seven of the access and management that I talked about that the streetscapes along internal streets. So I get that, you know, I, you can point to what you consider a collector street and an internal street, but even internal streets and driveways shall exhibit a compact layout, form and scale, which means, you know, not very wide. So it, to me, again, it feels like you want to have your cake and eat it too, which I totally understand because <laughs> this is this is completely new ground here. But we also have to, it says the streetscape shall be designed with shade trees on both sides, road widths that are of compact urban scale, human scale street lighting, frequent intersections and crosswalks and sidewalks. The streetscapes of internal streets may also include on-street parking on or both sides. Streets or driveways, so I, I don't, again, I don't, this is what we have to go by. And I, I totally understand those things. To me, the interpretation of that is that's Innovation Way, that's Center Street, that's not the private shared access drive. And because the design and the look of the private access drive was to be able to be shared with the sites as it was just simply, almost as if you will, within a shopping center where you have you know, utility access points, you have your shared access to parking on either side in order to maintain that compact nature of that. I totally understand that streetscape requirement. That's all been addressed as part of Innovation Way and Center Street. And as we go through with this process, we certainly are cognizant of the fact that we want to provide a nice looking building. We want to provide a nice looking layout, those types of things. But functionally, when you're sharing an access over private lots that come in there, you're going to not be in the same setting as a municipal street with a 50-foot independent dedicated right of way. Yes. <clears throat> when, when you folks were before us previously, yes. um, there was a discussion about the private ways. Yes. And you were going to have a meeting with staff. Mm -hmm. I assume you had that meeting. That meeting has not happened. We're still developing the policy oh, okay. Okay. document with the planning department staff because it's just a very complex okay. situation. Right. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's still a debatable issue, I guess. Um, <clears throat> my only comment here is that, I mean, they're coming in here and they're actually abiding by what the guidelines are as far as I can see. That this this particular business just requires this number of parking spaces. Lot seven could be a business that doesn't may require just a fraction of that. We don't know, um, or may require the same thing. But that's what this whole district is designed to um, be. I guess the, I guess the issue is we're still trying to figure out these private ways and whether they. Like Robin said, they re require all these, um, the landscaping or, or 
I mean, it does shed. I don't know how you do all this landscaping myself. So. Uh, so we have the back lot, right? You're familiar with this? No, Dan is. So when when you look at, I'm sorry, the rest of the board can't really peek at this. Um, I think that's the struggle right here is uh, if you look at the principal frontage, which I guess um, if, if we made that lot six, right? So you have a secondary frontage, you have a principal frontage, you have the private drive right here. So the private drive, so this would essentially, this actually would, the way it's pictured right now, would remind me what lot seven would look like, I guess, right? You got the principal frontage kind of coming there. This would be lot six over here. And I think what, um, you know, Jamel had kind of pointed out is these look like roadways that are 25 feet wide. And what, and I think the disconnect, I, I suspect, is we're 25 feet wide from like a parking space already. So if, if neighbor B comes in and they put to 25, and this goes back to where Jen was saying, now you've got a 50 foot drive aisle. It doesn't, it doesn't look, like a, look like a cohesive driveway which is, it is a driveway. I mean, I, I give you that. That's what it's labeled as. It's supposed to be a private drive. I get that. Like, I'm there. I'm there. I'm at that point. But why is your driveway 50 feet wide? Potentially. That's, I think, where I get stuck. So if you could help me make that better, I would feel more comfortable. <laughs> do you want to jump in? Or do you want, do you want me to answer this question? Or do you want to jump I think, there's, I think there is the General, opportunity we don't have to... Well, we don't need consensus. You need majority. In terms of duplicating 25-foot drive aisles on both sides of the property line, um, I don't think that would be the intent. I think the intent is there's an opportunity for on the lot seven side to potentially have parking off of that that 25-foot wide or 24-foot wide. Just if you look uh, right opposite where that stop bar is, where the road turns onto lot six. Um, there's potential for parking spaces to start on the other side of that surface. So there's not another, you know, 25 foot drive aisle to provide that. That I think that gets at having a more compact layout to duplicating the same infrastructure where you're using the same same driveway. Um, it's just it's pretty tricky on lot seven to forecast how exactly it's going to lay out. They may not want access to go past a driveway into the site that's right across from that first driveway you're entering on the south side of the building. And then that whole sort of setback area where the hand is right now on the plan is, is open space. Or they may want to work with the private drive and extend it further and have parking right off of it and then access the site. So it's it's tricky for Zoom Drain in this case to kind of be a pioneer and uh, pick this lot um, and do what they need on their site, um, following the town's rules around impervious cover and dry aisle width. I mean, the 25 feet didn't come from the applicant; it came from the town's ordinance. So, if there's appetite for a waiver of the dry aisle to 23 to 24, I mean, that's that's really the the board saying. We want to see a narrower driveway versus the ordinance saying that. Um, I think the applicant's open to adjusting the width of the drive aisle. They they have reasons for it to be two-way, but if it's narrower, that to some degree, I'm sure that could work uh, to re reduce impervious area. But it's what we don't want to do is show scenario on lot seven that the app the future applicant doesn't want or doesn't work for them, and then come to the board and say, well. You guys showed us with lot six, this is how lot seven is accessed um, because that's probably not going to help the board down the road and, or, or a future applicant. So it's, it's a tricky scenario. Can I just speak to something? Jamal, would you mind putting that exhibit back up there? Sure. So we're at the end of the road. And as you described, let's say that's lot seven. And lot six is on the other side, but it's identical. The mirror image of it. We have a 24 foot paved area that extends all the way up to the end of the property line 
that is not used effectively in that we have a drive aisle for the parking on lot seven, if you will. With the mirror image, we have the same drive aisle on lot six. So we have three drive aisles when we really only need two. That's what we attempted to do with the layout in shortening it up and terminating it at that point. We kept it on the property line simply because that's the minimum that we need to maneuver. We're not parking over in that area by the overhead doors. But we don't know what will happen on that lot. We tried not to have sort of that artificial extension of that road going right up the middle to the very end of the project. We terminated it, sure. And the attempt was to try to reduce that overall amount of impervious area on the site. But it does make for a perhaps non-traditional, if you will, layout. I have a question, if you don't mind if I jump in. Um, so I know with past site plans, the planning board has asked for future potential access, you know, through plan notes or, and I don't know if you guys feel comfortable putting that on a plan to show that it could be future access, designating it as future access. I, I don't know if that would help. Well, the easement shows on the plan now. I guess I meant to the south, like where the curbing is. Um, I don't know if that would help the board, but I'd, it just seems like if this is approved, then maybe the access will never be, unless it's a, memorialized in some way. I don't, I don't know. To the ability to have that be an, an opportunity. You're talking about the, the drive aisle that's on the southern side of the site, to note that as a potential shared drive aisle with Lot 11? Yeah, because I guess we didn't know that until you told us that. Um, okay. Right? I mean, I, I don't want to speak for the board, but it just, yeah, I mean, and then, you know, say that it falls through and the other, a future applicant puts curbing backed up to that curbing. It just, it just sets up a weird scenario. If I may. Sure. So again, going back to the crossroads plan development standards, the ordinances by which we're bound to, to act. Um, section C, C1 says commercial design standards. All development within the district, Crossroads Plan Development District, must be consistent with the design standards for Scarborough's commercial districts, with the exception of the uses under subsection D14, which I went to. But what I also went to was the design standards for commercial districts, which says in determining whether a project is designed in accordance with the commercial district standards, the planning board may engage the services and appropriate professionals to, to determine this. So I guess what I'm asking is, Jamel, does this constitute whether or not this is in accordance with the commercial design standards? So if you look on the regulating plan for a mm -hmm. back lot, mm -hmm. it says all permitted uses are subject to the commercial design standards, if applicable, except for the following permitted uses. Yep. Uh, D14? This is in the regulating plan. Um, H oh, got H it. Okay. Which is basically the zoning for Innovation District. Okay. Additional zoning. And then it goes on to list what I believe is this use. Manufacturing, assembly, food processing, contractors' offices, shops, and storage yards. I'm not sure. Exempt from the commercial design standards. That's, That's that how I read this. Hmm. So I think we talked about that during master plan. Okay. And since it's an industrial park, there were, yep. I think the uses along Innovation Way, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, are subject to the design standards, but mm -hmm. in the back lots, it's, you've got to read the language here. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And I guess the point that I was trying to get to is, do, are there other points that we need to discuss other than the site access and the, the driveway? Yeah, so I was going to try to nudge us along a little. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we could probably be here all night. I'd rather not be. So uh, one of the other uh, items, you had a question regarding the trip generation, the, uh, yes. the fee. Okay. Um, that, my first question is going to go to Jamel, which is what ability do we have to modify that uh, or even... Uh, consider modifying what's required there. Um, I'd have to check in with our traffic peer reviewer, uh, who is our expert in traffic. 
I think the way he was seeing it is that they're permitting a future use, and my, you know, if they're permitting the future use, it's going to be permitted accordingly instead of phased. I, I, I haven't heard of that method, but maybe it's been used in the past, and I'd have to. I think I think my question was probably um, to the larger scope of things, which is what ability does this board have to modify how this is either paid or interpreted? Does this board have discretion to even? alter how this is uh, structured? I don't believe so. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I'd have to, I don't know for sure, so I don't want to, I know it doesn't answer your question, um, but I think, well, I think that can be handled with the condition. Um, okay. Anyway. So, which, which means, um, you know, subject to, we, we'd have to figure out if there was even an appetite. I'd hate to engage in a bigger appetite discussion. If we can't do it, without, we can't do if it. we can't do it, right. Um, Mr. Chair, I guess the way that we looked at it was on, for example, in a residential subdivision, there's a per lot fee that's assessed um, in that uh, for like the recreation fee, those types of things. And that is assessed as, as the lots come forward for permits. So um, in this case, we were just looking, the number seems high uh, based on the anticipated use. And so we just wanted to be able to have an opportunity to check back with reality uh, and be able to provide more detailed, more thorough information uh, for the review and calculation of those fees. And uh, am I correct in my assumption that there's there's not really a process to go back and say, hey, we overpaid, can we have a refund? I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to government. Um, for, for, when it's, so. for when it's worth, the um, what I know of the, um, I don't know how familiar people are with the IT trip generation process, but it's two maroon books that are about this big and they get updated, I don't know, every decade, <laughs> maybe slightly maybe slightly more frequent. Um, and it can be challenging to use, that is the industry standard for determining um, trip generation, but it can be difficult to interpret that for things like mixed, <coughs> mixed uses where it's a a variety of mixes, if you can follow. So like office use sometimes varies. It's medical office or it's office, and they're generally sort of similar. But where there is the potential for using some, having some maybe some uses that typically are associated with differing uh, trip generation rates, it, it, it is very, you know, this is the way that, that I've seen it done, which is someone sort of, you know, a professional taking their best guess at it. Um, based on similar similar cases. So if there isn't a, a good um, path forward for the types of uses that are going to be there, it might it could be very different, that's all I'm saying. So I think um, if we got there tonight, there could be some language about investigating. Yeah, I think the traffic experts could work that out. I mean, I will say with subdivisions, the traffic impact fees are typically paid up front. Um, I think you're thinking of recreation. Correct. So it's, it's a little, you know, a little different. Um, but I think staff would be most comfortable with it being paid up front. It's the cleanest way. Um, but I think a discussion with the traffic experts would be warranted. Roger. Yeah, and just a question on the, uh, the future tenants. Um, would they just have to go before the um, the planning department, they wouldn't have to have to necessarily come to this board, would they? Um, As it's written in the application, it's warehousing or office, so mm -hmm. I think that's their intention, so I don't see it needing to come to planning board unless it, you know, changes significantly. So, okay. Well, I think it's worth researching the, uh, the whole thing because we might see more of this in this, this uh, district, I, I suspect. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, um, All right, so uh, other big items. Did the board pick up on any other, or staff, or? The, the biggie is the utility pole. The utility pole? <laughs> no utility pole, right? It's all underground. So the private way. I wanted um, to say that before, Rick did. Nah. <laughs> As I understand it, in the approval for the innovation district, in private ways where there was to be three-phase power, this is one of those locations 
that the three phase power would be overhead so we do have an overhead line along the private way to an underground service to the building um, and so that was one of the comments that actually was raised by staff uh, was that power pole uh, and it had been our understanding through the original approvals that in the private ways that did have three phase <coughs> power um, that that power lines those power lines would be overhead along the private way so I'll just to remind the board you approved a subdivision plan that had a <coughs> plan that depicted overhead power um, and it did not include this private drive so I, I I don't feel comfortable with that based on past approvals and I'm just going to quickly clarify the I think we just clarified again this most recent meeting or workshop right, at the workshop that three-phase power was going to be taken down Scarborough Downs Road only and center the, the major and then it was underground everywhere else it's what that, we were told so I think that's that is a sticking point in my world anyone else yeah yeah I think that's what the expectation will be I will follow up um, other biggies anyone the landscaping plan uh, shows hold on the landscaping plan shows future reserve parking um, to the north of the site but neither of the other neither of the other plans did I don't know if that's um, it also looks like actually that overlaps a little bit with the snow storage area which I know can be flexible but um, I just didn't know if that was intended or so the very last yeah. page has an exhibit that shows what that site would look like with 40 parking spaces okay. and that exhibit was prepared based gotcha. on the most intense use of the entire 10,000 square foot building for office space at four spaces per thousand square feet so that shows um, potential future parking if that ever, that use ever changed we don't anticipate that at all um, but that's why those plantings were put around that gotcha so it was just a hold just holding it out around that area thanks Nick yes Rick um, when you resubmit can you throw in the um, photometric of the six or seven I don't know the wall packs that you're going around I like the fact that you're not sticking a bunch of poles in this parking area or anything like that they're actually trying to do all the lights with the perimeter of the building Correct, yeah. uh, but it doesn't I see this what they're saying is the layout but can you get the documentation that shows that's what yes. the photometric is yep thanks so you want the, the building plans showing where they are physically uh, I want it I want it on the cut sheet I want that the uh, light distribution photometric on the cut sheet okay I think it's just missing a page all right all right so at this point I'm gonna say you guys are so very close um, and I think it would be very helpful if there is an example somewhere in this world that we can see a photo of this being done something similar I'm I'm pretty much already there in the sense that it's a private drive you're you're granting access to the site might not necessarily um, I'm careful to make sure that my thoughts of what the innovation district may have looked like are not what you're proposing because that's not my job so um, but I think it would help visually if I had any even if it's a, as Jamal said like even even some sort of schematic that shows us what that next lot could look like you know I mean I think it's the first one and this is so difficult for it I mean I think you can sense how difficult this has been for the board to visualize um, something to help us get there I think there's a little bit of clean cl uh, plan cleanup left there's not much left to really go over um, and then I think I'd like an answer on whether or not we can help with the traffic impact fees to a more realistic um, reflection, whether or not that's within our purview as a board. Yeah. Um, and, and that would be, I think, homework for maybe Jamel to, mm -hmm. to dig out for us to see if that's something we have the authority to do. Um, that said, is there anything else? 
from this board or the applicant that we really need before they come back because I'd really like to get this one hammered down. If I may, it's just um, going back to the staff comment about um, is this curbed all the way around the property or is the, I think in the, in the, in the staff memo, is it under stormwater management? It talks about uh, how the site runoff from the westerly property line will be conveyed to the stormwater pond. So is it curb and gutter all the way around? No. No. It is curbed on the southerly side. There is a catch basin basically near the dumpster area on the southwest corner. The runoff from the westerly side of the site, actually there's a uh, existing drain manhole that is part of the uh, stormwater conveyance system to pond one. Okay, and I, I'm gonna, right I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just, I wanna make sure like that all of the, do you have any questions on the staff comments or do you feel like you can move forward on this? Because I, I'm, I'm concerned about encroachment. I understand what you're saying about you can go out into the easement for the private way, but I, I'm still concerned about encroachment, whether it's stormwater runoff or too close to the, to the borders kind of thing. So as part of the design of these lots, mm -hmm. all of the stormwater is conveyed to that pond. That was in the original design mm -hmm. of the Innovation District. Okay. So um, what the question arises in the fact that that drain manhole, there was a note to be put on there that that is to be converted to a catch basin. Okay. And that would provide just the, just the rim, okay. just yeah. to provide an inlet there. Um, the rest of it on the north and the uh, east side drains to a series of catch basins that are along that common lot line that are piped in and go right into the pond itself. So the design, if you recall from the overall design of the Innovation District, there are provisions that provide for the treatment and the uh, attenuation of the runoff from these lots provided that uh, they don't exceed 80% of impervious coverage. If they do, uh, then there is a requirement to have on-site treatment only for that excess mm -hmm. uh, impervious cover. We're not at that point, so everything is just a direct discharge into the system that's already been provided at the site and goes into the pond right there. Yeah, and I, <coughs> I guess I, I, I I'm going to put a uh, plug in to get the the master plan sort of provision so that. Um, I can equip myself appropriately, but um, as long as the applicant works with staff to, to meet the staff's expectations, I'm, I have nothing further. Yeah, I think that would be the last suggestion, which is if maybe you could try to get a quick meeting with staff to go over the, I was some of these. thinking the same that yeah. Jamel and I could meet and go over the and, specifics. And you know, the comfort level of um, staff as they go through all these details really does go a long way with how our comfort levels. Sure. So, um, not that we. We are independent of our own concerns, but you understand too. Yeah, yeah. I do understand. Right. Um, our the next submittal deadline is Friday, so Jamel, if I could get into your calendar, that would be good. <laughs> yeah, you okay. said it's gonna be. We'll work it out. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. If you have any questions, please yeah, let us know. Okay. I do appreciate your input. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item this evening is the staff report. All right, I'll make this quick. Um, we're rounding out 2019. So first, first year's chair, I think you've done a really good job. Just wanted to throw that out there, Nick. I can't believe that's only been a year. Keeping us on track. <laughs> um, so in 2020, um, we will be doing appointments, um, or the, you guys, the board will be doing appointments for chair, vice chair, and secretary. It will be on the January 6th agenda. And uh, committee uh, appointees or liaisons um, to transportation and the long range planning committee will also be on the agenda. So think about, um, think about that for next time. And that's all I have. Thank you. And um, just out of curiosity, we do we have, when is the council voting for the terms or have they already voted on the terms? Because we have two expiring that I'm aware of, which is uh, mine and Rachel's, are both expiring this year. Um, I can look into that. They may have already, um, but I think you would have received notification of that. So I'll 
I'll check in and, and loop back to you guys. Sure. He wants to know if he should come in January or not. That's correct. <laughs> 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 um, no, and, and then just, um, so assuming, I, I believe Rachel had uh, re-upped her interest as well, but assuming that we would maintain the same board, which is a nice um, to have some cohesiveness and another year of working together and lower turnover. So uh, let's, it's good news. All right, administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. Correspondence? No correspondence. Uh, planning board comments. I'll make one. Um, last meeting of the year. It was a pretty busy year, I think, by any benchmark <laughs> used, uh, any type of yardstick. That was a busy year. I think staff has done an incredible job. Um, Doreen and Jamel, Jay, Angela, I mean, uh, everything we do is a hundred times easier because you guys are hanging out. Um, I've had a conversation or two with some other planning board members from other communities. They would give anything to be the, in the position we're in and very, very grateful for all of that uh, the staff does. So. Always happy to help. Um, and then the most favorite motion of the evening. I will make a motion to adjourn this meeting. I'm going to second. Any discussion? All in favor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>